seven o'clock sharp. Good evening, everyone. So I welcome all of you. I pray the Almighty for giving us strength during these tough times. I would also like I would also like to thank all the uh, persons who are working in the forefront for the coronavirus, like uh, not just the doctors but the paramedical staff, the technicians, uh, and all the uh, all the other helpers who are working for us in these tough times. Uh, may God give them strength and endurance in this uh, tiring times. Now I would uh, I would call upon uh, Dr. Ginish Parmar sir to address the gathering. So uh, to start uh, to initiate the discussion. So good evening, everyone. Welcome to the second panel discussion on very important and essential topic that is restoperiosymbiosis. A sound periodontium provides a firm foundation for an aesthetic and functional prosthesis. So when restorations are required, shall be designed such that they create self-ending interfaces between two structures and periodontium and shall promote highest functions along with health to the periodontium. We have galaxy of stars of this important panel discussion from three different specialties. That is conservative dentistry, periodontia, and prosthetics. I heartily welcome the esteemed panelists in their subjects. Professor Dr. Ramya Raghu, uh, she is a professor and HOD at Biggs, Bangalore. Dr. Jayashree Hagade Madam, she is the clinical director at Bangalore and she is the mentor of Indian Board of micro and Endodontics Fellowship Program. We are going to start soon. Dr. and Professor Sanjay Tiwari, very eminent personality in our profession. He is HOD and principal at Rohtak Dental College and sir was also executive committee member of the Council, Dental Council of India. Madam Nimphia Pandit, she is the president of Indian Society of Periodontics and she is the alumna of GDC and the Bar. Dr. Dr. T. Padmanabhan, he is the chairman board of directors Moderator of today's program, Professor Digyasha. She is also professor at Rohtak and sitting EC member of ICD. Event coordinator of today's program is Dr. Laura. She is also professor at Bhuvaneswar and sitting EC member of the ICD. I wish all the best to all the panelists and all the uh, viewers for one of the best uh, program organized by ICD. Thanks to Thank Dr. Mohan and HO. Over to moderator, please. Thank you so much, sir, for your encouraging words, sir. Now we begin with the uh, uh, panel discussion. I, before that, I would uh, uh, welcome Dr. V. Chandra Se uh, Se Shekhar, President IACD, and Dr. Mohan. Uh, Secretary IACD. Uh, now I would uh, thank you for giving us this platform, sir. And uh, now I would like to welcome all the panelists. Uh, first, I'll introduce Dr. T. V. Sir, he is a graduated from Mughal College, uh, Madras, uh, in the year 1988. He's a diplomat of international. Uh, he is a diplomat of International College of uh, Oral Implantology. Sir has been a part of Indian uh, Prosthodontic Society and he's, he was uh, a president of uh, uh, Prostodont Indian Prosthodontic Society. Uh, he has been a member of the, he is only member from India who has been a part of the uh, Asian Academic Society of Os Osseo Integration. Sir is the first Indian to hold, uh, Indian to hold such uh, post. I welcome you, sir. Uh, the second panelist among we have uh, among us we have Dr. Sanjay Tiwari, uh, sir. He he is presently principal of Postgraduate Institute of Dental Sciences and heading the department of conservative dentistry in uh, in the same institution. And uh, he is he post graduated in the year 1988 from uh, KMC Lucknow. Uh, sir, sir is a uh, member from past. So he was a E member. Now he has been heading. He is a chairman uh, of many academic uh, committees and many other 
committees of the uh, Dental Council of India, and Sir has uh, uh, has a fellowship from King's College London on stem cells, so uh, Commonwealth Fellowship. Next to among we have Dr. Ramya Raghu, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, post uh, ma'am is a gold. Uh, she is heading the department of conservative dentistry in uh, Bangalore Institute of Dental Sciences, Bangalore. Uh, ma'am, uh, post grad uh, post graduated in the year uh, 1993 from G uh, Government Dental College, Bangalore, and ma'am is a gold medalist during her undergraduate years. She has 26 years of teaching experience has many publications in national and international publications. Uh, to her credit, ma'am has been a keynote speaker to many uh, national and uh, in, uh, international, uh, international conferences also. Uh, ma'am has, uh, uh, Dr. Ramya Raghu ma'am has uh, authored book along with her husband of operative dentistry. Uh, I welcome you, ma'am. Uh, Thank the next you. panelist among we have a uh, renowned periodontist from Yamna Nagar, Dr. Nymphia Pandit, ma'am. Uh, she's uh, wo working in DAV Yamna Nagar uh, College as the head of the department, and ma'am is the uh, president of the Indian uh, Periodontic Society also. Ma'am gradu uh, uh, ma graduated from uh, uh, and in 1993, and she was graduated in Perry from Ahmedabad College, the Government Dental College, Ahmedabad, in the year 1998. Uh, again, she got she was the best graduate, outgoing graduate, and Ma'am uh, received a gold medal award also, and also the Colgate Palmolive Par Award. Ma'am has many uh, international and national uh, publications. She is the keynote speaker in many uh, conferences, and also she is a uh, she has authored many books. Next among we have a renowned endodontist from Bangalore, uh, Dr. Shri Hegre Anil, ma'am. Uh, she graduated from Government Dental College, Bangalore, and post-graduated from the same institute in the year 1996. Ma'am was heading the department uh, in Oxford Dental College till 2013, then ma'am went into the practice, and now she is di uh, uh, director at Ridgetop Dental International Season to private practice. And she's basically working mostly on aesthetics, micro dentistry, and implants. She has many publications. She's a key, she has been a keynote speaker to uh, many conferences. I would like to welcome you, ma'am. And she's ma'am is also a renowned member of many association aesthetic associ uh, dentistry associations. So I welcome you all uh, to this uh, panel discussion uh, 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 of ISCD on restroperio symbiosis. So first, uh, we, all, we, very, we, all, we all are well aware of the proximity of the restorative uh, margins and the restorations to the periodontal health, periodontal, and these two are inseparable. So for a long, uh, for a long term survival, for any uh, sir, uh, restoration, for its long term survival, we uh, require a periodontal tissue which is healthy and which is not inflamed. So thus the periodontal tissue, healthy periodontal tissue is a prerequisite to both the restorative uh, and the prosthodontic uh, restorations. So uh, beginning with this, uh, when we talk about uh, resto, uh, perio restorative interrelationship or prosthodontic restorative interrelationship, the first thing which, we, uh, which comes to our um, mind is that what is biological width? So I would like to, Dr. Nimfia ma'am to emphasize on uh, the biological width a little bit. Uh, because this is a very important uh, aspect of the restoration, uh, restora uh, restoration as in relation to the periodontal tissues. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I welcome you all to this discussion. Where this is uh, this is the place where we are we are talking about uh, resto perio symbiosis. So this is the place where uh, the two tissues, where the two specialties basically meet. This is uh, this uh, portion of the periodontium are the tissues which are above the alveolar crust, that is the connective tissue and the junctional epithelium. Now, uh, on an average, this uh, length is almost from the, that is supracrustal tissues, we call them, above the bone, that is the connective tissue which is attaching to the tooth structure and the junctional epithelium. These are called supracrustal tissues and these tissues are the area of interaction between any respiration and the periodontium. Now, this is uh, generally the average width of this is usually 2.04. 
which consists of uh, the, the connector tissue attachment of around 1.07 and 0.77 mm of the epithelium. Now this is a, an average build. This can vary because this bone level, what you are seeing on the slide, may vary from a high crest, medium crest or a low crest. But on an average, we take this much. So any patient, if we are doing it, we are trying to uh, think about this area where the problems can start, we will have to think about the uh, level of the bone. If there is a low crest bone, we are safe. If it's a high crest bone, then we have to take into consideration that we may have to change this area so that the uh, restoration can be adjusted in that area. That is this. Because if you violate this width, this is going to create problems. If you violate this width, if you are going into that width, on these tissues, the problem will be that there will be inflammation and bone will try to resolve. And over a period of time, the restoration will not have its long-term effects and it will be a, uh, it will not be a successful type of a restoration. So that is the importance of this area of the periodology. Well, I came across an article which suggests that there is a clinical and radio, which uh, one, uh, there is a relationship, a correlation between the radiographic parameters and uh, uh, invasion and clinical uh, uh, consideration of the bone crest and the gingival recession. So, uh, ma'am, what uh, what is the, yeah. what are the what we are doing clinically is that by we we see the uh, depth of the sulcus, we see the uh, level of the bone, we see that with a probe. Now what happens is that probe may not stop exactly at the point where the uh, junctional epithelium starts. It may go beyond that. If it's inflamed, the chances are that the probe will go beyond that area. So we may not be actually uh, seeing the histological width. We may be seeing something which is more than what is present over there. If it goes beyond the junctional epithelium, it will have more. So the clinical, uh, clinical depth of the pocket may be, most of the times, will be more than what is the histological width. So to ascertain that what we are doing and exactly what we are doing, we are taking gingival margin and the alveolar crust. What we are doing is that we anesthetize the area, we do transgingival probing. Now this is something which is hard. So we go beyond the pocket depth up to the crest and we measure that distance. And that is more important because we are talking about the biological bit, we should know where the crest is. So we go about evaluating the crust on the buccal side, on the interdental side, and that's why it varies, because a probe can go beyond the junctional epithelium, and we may not be actually measuring the actual depth of the sulcus or the periodontal pocket. So that is the importance of the radiographs. The radiographs are uh, giving us the exact location of the crust, although they are giving the two-dimensional structures, then we can correlate that with sounding what I was telling you, transgingival probing. We push the probe with double, the pressure and go up to the crest and we can measure that and correlate it with the histological points and we will know exactly where the crest is. So madam, we call it bone sounding, eh? Yeah, we call it bone sounding. Bone sounding because that is the best or method. Trans I, yeah, thank you. Or transgingival probing. Madam, so, is there a possibility that you might damage the periodontium while doing the bone sounding? No, no, we are doing that before surgery. We anyway have to go for anesthesia and if we are going to uh, see the radiograph. From the radiographs, we will get an idea. But if we are going to have crown lengthening or we are going to do anything about that bone, we will uh, anyway have to go for flap and before flap we are giving anesthesia. In the long term, this is not going to harm. It. It will is there any change in the direction of the probe when you are doing your yeah. bone sound? There are many factors which affect the um, width, the, the uh, length, what we measure. There are the, the probe uh, tip. If it's 0.5 millimeter, it will measure the proper distance. If it's thicker, it will measure less distance. If the angulation is changed over a period of time, it will measure different distances. So what we do is that, that is how the generation of probes came. We have first generation that were manual probes, so pressure was not there and we did not have the uh, control over the direction. Over a period of time, we had pressure sensitive probes so that equal pressure at every time was there and there was a reproducible type of pocket depth that we measured. And over a period of time, we had even computer outcome and all that. But uh, uh, that transgenual probing we do with the manual probe only. What we do with the manual probe. So all the things, the direction, the uh, width of the probe tip, and uh, the pressure, these are going to affect the, um, uh, the depth of the uh, pocket what we are measuring. And to have the same direction, we sometimes prepare stent. Stent is something, it's an acrylic uh, bite, which we prepare and we prepare a groove over there. In the groove, we put the probe. And every time we are probing, we will be probing in the same direction. So we take 
care of the dis, uh, direction of the probe. We take care by the pressure sensitive probes and uh, by the tip. So these are two or three things why we needed to have different types of probes to have a reproducible type and more accurate measurement of uh, this type. Maybe you are standardizing it this way. Yeah, we are standardizing it this way. Lovely. Uh, Tiwari sir, we have offer, we have come across often uh, that uh, this bo um, biological width violation is basically be, uh, because of the caries removal procedures. So how can we uh, prevent that? See, madam, uh, uh, first of all, I thank uh, Dr. Mohan and uh, uh, IACD for giving me opportunity to speak here, and that made me. I was reading it so many. I, I must accept that we are not knowing much about the the periorestorative interface and. It has been ready, written in all the books, whether postorontics, periodontics, and conservative, that we must know first thing to respect the relationship between the restoration and the periodontia. Please, please remember this thing. We must know, learn to respect the relationship. If we know the to respect the relationship, then everything works. If you don't, don't respect it, then things don't, don't work. So that is what common thing which we are doing it there in practice. We must respect this thing. Uh, secondly, uh, about the biological bit, I want to add something. See the articles of which we have said the biological width of 2.04 millimeter. That was of a Gorgilo article published in 1961. The study was done in 30 subjects of 287 cadavers. The second study, which was done in 1994 by the Vesek, that was done in 1994. Again, only in 10 cadavers. And they have said that it's not the 1.32, 1.14, from 0.7. There is a range. So every clinician, please see when you are talking about biological weight, please see that these may range. Don't take it as if it is 1.14 junction epithelium, 0.77 this epithelium. It may vary for everything. So that's why what Dr. Nymphia has said, please go for bone sounding. That is the best way to know what is the distance between, between the albuterus and the margin which you have to keep at three minute distance. Please make this remember this thing for, for my clinicians. I want to, uh, to tell our endodontist or, or resident dentist that you must remember this, this fact that every case is, 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 is very easy. Regarding Dr. Jigasa has said in this question that where should you give the margins? See, I was going through whenever you are placing the when you are, when you are violating going more than one millimeter beyond the gingival sulcus, you have to you are chances of encroaching the junctional epithelium and the uh, your biological bits. Nowadays, we, we call it the term, not biological, not biological bits, the new term has come, that, 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 that is the dentogingival complex, where we also add the sulcus. So, we, the moment we go beyond one millimeter beyond the sulcus, there are chances of violating is there. So, we have to be careful in that way. So, there are different methods are there. I was reading the thing, one is the, this your deep margin elevation method is there that you, but everywhere they are saying, whatever thing you do, whether you, you know, do the deep, deep margin elevation, the moment you enclose the junction epithelium, the moment you enclose the connective tissue, you have to go for crown lengthening. If you are able to not to maintain it, you are able to attain the attain the expiration feed. If you are able to apply a profile my band, do a, let a contour, then you can do all that deep, 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 deep margin elevation. Second thing about the materials, it was being told I was reading the student. Whatever I am talking, I am talking to you. What I have read in the from the books, so the student says that the, the gerstor material is the best whenever their margins are sub, are subgenerable. It is because this is a dual cure, uh, dual cure glass polymer cement. Secondly, not only dual cure, it's the important thing is that that dual cure GIC has polymer shrinkage minimum, coefficient of thermal expansion similar to that of truth, the solubility is minimum. So these are the important properties. Besides, besides a material having a property to be compatible with the parental tissue, which allows the growth of parental tissue, we have to have a material which have got least polymer shrinkage, which have got coefficient of thermal expansion similar to that of truth, which have least solubility and which can be properly polished. They are the restorative material choice. So as per the student, the jerry store they have said is the best material. And we have but only thing is that we have to ensure that the material must be properly polished and should not encroach the junctional epithelium, should not encroach the biological bit. If it is encroached, then in that case we have to go for the some sort of sound lengthening. I have a question from the audience. How much maximum bone can be removed horizontally? to create and maintain the biological width, especially when there is very less axial height of the crown and the crown lending is mandatory. Uh, Nymphia ma'am, will you be able, to, uh, will you take this question please? Yes. So how much bone is done? See, we have looking at two, three things now. We have to look at, you have a slide of the gingival biotype. We have to look at the attached gingiva. We have to look at the bone. 
Now, whatever uh, length of the root is left, as Sir uh, said in those uh, the lectures, that we don't follow that NPS rule now. That how much bone can be removed? That uh, it can be maintained with a minimum root covered with the bone also. So what we need to do that uh, we will calculate how much is required for the retention for the crown. How much is required? We will ask that from the restorative dentist, and then we have to have the bone at least three millimeter from that margin. so that will uh, that will create enough tissue enough uh, space for the connective tissue and the junctional epithelium to form so depending upon how much bone is already present how much you need for the restoration how much how much length you need for the junction we will have to calculate where the present crest is where the present uh, sulcus is and how much is left after we remove that particular bone so that depends upon how much is required for that particular type of crown Is there any minimum value, ma'am, of, of for what? For the root, for maximum uh, bone which can be removed. Sir, we're saying one to one ratio is also allowed. One to one ratio is also okay. If uh, half of the root is uh, covered with the bone and half is uh, left for the retention form, that will also that also stays for a long time. Okay. May I come in in this situation? Yes, sir. Please do. Yeah. Yes, sir. The, uh, The, the the amount of uh, bone to be removed during a crown lengthening procedure is dependent upon the amount of root that has to go inside the bone so as the madam was saying whenever we give a crown or uh, any inlay or any restorative uh, indirect restorative the failure mode is a rotational failure so you have to have enough axial length there are two ways of increasing the axial length one coronally one the second is apically what we are talking is apically so if you are talking in terms of uh, the axial correct axial height and uh, the correct axial height should be as much as the diameter of the tooth because the rotational failure is a bucco lingual rotation the bucco lingual width should be the axial length after the preparation so if you are able to gain as much as about say 3 mm uh, 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 you want to gain 3 mm from the existing tooth i think we have to reduce as much as about 4.5 to 5 mm from the crest that means you will be uh, uh, contouring the bone so that there is enough amount of uh, biological width and the crown root ratio you can have it as much as 1 is to 1 if it is going to be non favorable you can always splint it with the adjacent tooth you sir i have a question here Yep. What about furcation exposure? If that happens, if you are removing more bone, yeah, th 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 obviously, if there is going to be a furcation, there is going to be a huge problem. And I have to modify the crown preparation so that I have to incorporate what's called fluting in the preparation and in the final restoration also, so that there is going to be a favorable uh, uh, gingival uh, stimulation during mastication. So you have to have, you know, this is a very non-ideal situation. we are not talking about a very ideal situation you don't come across this very often but this is an exceptional situation and uh, you have to make a compromise depending upon the clinical situation and depends upon the case by case situation you cannot have a numerical value can i have a numerical value can i remove 3 mm i don't think that is possible i think it all depends upon case by case situation rather than a, a general rule of 2 mm or 3 mm this is my opinion Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, Anindya, ma'am, like we are talking about, we are, we, you were talking about gingival biotype. So, I would like to ask, see, what precautions has to be taken when you are when we are doing a restoration when the patient has thin and scalloped biotype, or when the patient has thick and flat biotype? Right. See, gingiva always follows the bone in health. So, if you are looking at the thin and scalloped biotype. so what you are looking at that is the facial bone is slightly apic is more apical than the interdental that is normal also but in thin biotype the difference between the tooth is too much so when you are having a restoration on such a type of tooth you will have to take into consideration the margin should be more uh, the uh, coronal in the interdental area because the bone will also be in the more coronal direction in the thick type the difference between the facial bone and the and the interdental bone is not that much so that should be taken into consideration consideration plus another thing is that if you are insulting the gingiva in the thin biotype the chances of recession are more because it's only the end arteries which are supplying the gingival zone 
and if those get disrupted there will there will be necrosis of the marginal gingiva and you can land up with recession and uh, you are trying to restore it aesthetically and you are creating more uh, anesthetic situation in surgery and in the thick biotype if you are having a problem you will have inflammation and you will have contours which are thick which are not nice mar as margin and uh, to avoid such problems you will always have to think that in thin biotype the marginal bone in the buccal and the lingual area is more apical uh, there is more difference between the buccal lingual uh, bone in the apical direction than the interdental area and interdental area because it's thicker that will support more uh, blood supply so the chances of recession are more in the buccal and the lingual area in the thin biotype and in the thick biotype there are more chances if you are violating the biological width that there will be inflammation and there will be loss of the marginal contour and you will not have that typical uh, zenith of the different thing of the gingiva in the different thing that will be the uh, so ma'am it's like uh, you uh, you mean to say that according to the uh, gingival biotype whether it is thin or thick we have to uh, more uh, 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 change our uh, restorative procedures according to these biotypes right. so that also guidance is given by sounding and your radiograph so you, from the radiograph and by your sounding you will come to know where the bone is and uh, generally speaking if uh, what i was telling you that gingiva always follows the uh, bone in health and it always uh, it it goes in the opposite direction in disease for example if you have a disease gingiva the bone goes in apical direction and gingiva goes in coronal direction because it gets inflamed but in health when you are achieving the health that is the first part of doing any restoration then at that time you should be able to calculate exactly where the bone is from the clinical point of view you will get an impression where it can be but with the radiograph and sounding you will know exactly why and again the rule follows that you the margin should be at least 3 mm away from the thrust ma'am i have a question uh, from dr kartik uh i would uh, i wish dr padmanabhan and dr nimpha ma'am to uh, give a view on this what is the time gap between uh, gingivectomy and placement of a crown and could we place the crown immediately after gingivectomy sometimes uh, would you sir like to say or should i say first and then you can no, no kindly go ahead madam i'll join you later sir what i uh, what i have seen when we are treating patients in the clinics what happens is sometimes uh, there is some gingiva is coming on the tooth structure and we are trying to remove it and we are asking the patient to wait for 6 weeks by the by the time he comes back there is again gingiva at the same side so this is sort of a tussle between a periodontist and a periodontist he says i you i asked you to expose this much and uh, you, i am left with half of that what you said so always we think about over correction in these cases because uh, we will always expect that some or in particularly in gingivectomy cases because we are going right up to the bone we are expecting the gingiva to go over that so at the time of surgery whatever we achieved we are always going to lose 2 to 3 mm that so we should calculate we should uh, add that 2 mm and remove some extra bone and extra gingiva from that area if we want to have a stable gingival tissue uh, over to padmanabhan sir yeah uh, i agree with uh, uh, madam uh, it all depends again on the clinical situation if you're going to do a, a, a gingivectomy procedure for anterior aesthetics you have to wait for the maturation of the tissue there is absolutely no uh, concessions on that at all and if for few reasons if the patient is going to show signs of early healing maybe you can take it up a week earlier but mm -hmm. there is no concessions at all whatsoever regarding the healing time if it is 6 weeks you have to wait for 6 weeks otherwise margins will certainly as madam said it's going to is going to shrink over a period of time and before you healing you start manipulating there is going to be injury and more recession so in my opinion if it is for the aesthetics in the anterior restoration Six weeks is mandatory. Absolutely mandatory. There is no questions at all. Now the question is: Are you going to combine the restoration also along with the gingivectomy? Um, maybe a temporary restoration. If a patient comes with a fracture in sizes and he wants a gingivectomy and a crown as a temporary measure, it is always preferable to give a temporary restoration, which uh, which does which is not over contoured. It's very very important. Contouring is the most important thing. because you if it is over contoured there is no avenue for the gingiva to heal properly the second situation you do gingivectomy even if you are going to do a class 2 inlays or something like that in those particular situations i don't think we can afford to wait for about 8 weeks 
for uh, six weeks for total uh, maturation because it is a non-critical situation and the contact is much, much more important than the uh, other situation. So we would like to start the procedure of making the impressions and preparing, preparing the tooth in, in, in less than a week's time. So it depends upon the situation. For anteriors, I would like to wait for uh, uh, six to eight weeks time for maturation of tissues. Whereas in a restorative procedure, like in case of an inlay uh, for the posteriors, I would like to wait for just a week's time and then start the birth. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. As we all know that uh, preserving the health of the gingival tissue and controlling the gingival form around the restoration is of the paramount importance. Now, when we have to place the margins, uh, I would address this to Dr. Padmanabhan, sir. So what uh, these are the uh, we have three different types of margins so preequi and subgingival as we know so which is the best mar uh, margin according to the restrictions and uh, where should we place the margins exactly? Okay, again, uh, there is no, uh, uh, no rule of thumb for uh, the margin placement, but uh, categorically you can you can you can say that for most of the posterior uh, restoration. <laughs> When you're crowned, you can always go in for a supra gingival preparations. And if you have to have a good high aesthetics, and if the biotype is a little, a sub gingival margin is always allowed in the anteriors. There are a lot of classifications. It says you can go up to 0 0.5 millimeters if the uh, pocketing deck is about 1.5 millimeters. If it is beyond, you have to do a periodontal therapy so that you make it as 1.5 and then go 1. I mean 0 0.5 subgingival. Subgingival uh, is indicated in two situations where you need good aesthetics. Number one, number two is when the axial length is not favorable. So you encroach about 0 0.5 or 0 0.75 millimeters into the uh, area. But the, the most danger comes not because of the margin, it, the most of the danger comes because of over contouring. And uh, the, 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 if you're going to analyze the, I'm sure uh, uh, Madam will also agree with me, if you're going to analyze the clavicular fluid uh, inflammatory marker, say uh, TNF alpha or uh, interleukins, if you're going to analyze in both the subgingival and the supragingival, both will almost be equal. It is not going to be different. The problem is the contouring of the crowns. The restorative uh, technician should be able to contour the crown so that there is going to be gingival stimulation and block control will also be there. So, particularly in the gingival portion of the restoration, that yep. which has to be, it, it, not, it should not go at all more than 0.5 millimeter of your original very true. survival. Very, very true. Now, so what about internal recession cases? I'm sorry. What? In case of gingival recession, in yeah. case of gingival recession, it is most preferable to go in till the uh, uh, you know like uh, supra gingival because if there is going to be a recession, it is not going to come in the smile line. Smile line is also a very very important factor that has to be taken into consideration when the gingival margin is not going to be included in the uh, uh, smile designing or it, if it is not going to be within the frame of the high lip line and the low lip line. What is the need for us to go subgingivally? Intentionally, you know very well that this is going to be, there is going to be an iatrogenic periodontitis. Why do you want to really do that? There is no need at all. So supragingival margin is the first choice whenever possible. Subgingival margin whenever high end aesthetics is required. And uh, these are the common axioms. There, then then uh, as, I, as, I, as I told you, if at all you want to go for anterior crowns where there is going to be uh, less critical uh, aesthetic requirements, you can always go for equal But ultimately, if you're going to analyze all these things over a period of about five or six years time, all these things will end up, all these things will end up only as a supra gingival margin. What happens if you're going to give a sub gingival margin with a little over contouring is there's going to be a difficulty in block control. There is going to be a recession over a period of about five to six years time. The recession rate in the first three years is very, very less. And after that, there is going to be a rapid recession. After about five years time, it stops because it becomes a supra gingival preparations. And then the, the recession almost stops. So in my opinion, any preparation which is going to be initiated even as a sub gingival will end up after five or six years time after a, 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 as a supra gingival uh, margin because you know the, the, the gingiva will eventually 
receipt after five or six years time. I would like to take uh, Dr. Nymphia's uh, opinion on this. Uh, yeah, I was telling you uh, the recession will be there if it's a thin gingival biotype, but otherwise there will be a continuous sort of inflammation if it's thick gingival type, like you can see from the slide also, here the periodontal treatment has not been finished, it's not over, before uh, the crown preparation has been taken, the, you can see the right slide. So it's very necessary that whenever restoration is done, the periodontal therapy should have been completed and we should wait for the healing time. If we are doing at this moment, the chances of recession and having uh, periodontal pockets and bone loss are more as compared to if you are taking uh, healthy periodontium. I'm not saying that you can have an uh, you can have an ideal periodontium where the CJ the uh, junctional epithelium is on the CJ, but you can have reduced periodontium but healthy periodontium without any inflammation because uh, the restoration themselves are going to place some uh, some pressure on the type of hygiene you are play, putting. Because it's very difficult, as I was saying, that the margins of the restoration are at least uh, 50 to 200 microns away from the tooth structure. And uh, bacteria are only 1 or 5 milli um in diameter. So you cannot expect. But uh, the thing is that if you have a good uh, contour, as I was saying, the contour, in, particularly in the gingival area, we can always maintain an oral hygiene. And some amount of gingival, uh, some amount of the bacterial flock can be handled by the body and uh, like sir you're saying that interleukins and dnf alpha you can always see them over there they are found in you can have never a pristine gingiva you will always have a healthy gingiva which is not which has subclinical inflammation but body can handle some amount of insult but on a long-term basis that patient should be able to remove the plaque from all the surfaces of all the teeth on a daily basis uh, uh, in the particularly in the restricted uh, restriction area where the margins are there. So um, contour is more important than why you place the margin. Uh, we see the picture on the left side. What pigment? Uh, what treatment can be done for the pigmentation? Uh, right. Uh, if you are have, uh, you want to have impeccable uh, type of uh, aesthetics. We need to not only go for the restoration. We need to have the pink gingiva. The problem is that the genetic message for the pigmentation is there, and uh, that uh, there the chances of recurrence are very low. But uh, we have seen in uh, the recurrence occurring in only 50% of the cases and that also occurs after 9 to 12 months and you can always, if the patient is so much keen upon an ideal aesthetic, you can always find another type of treatment. But there are many methods available. There are, uh, laser uh, can be used, we can use scalpel, we can just scrape off this tissue and new pink tissue can come over there. But uh, uh, with the studies, we have seen that uh, with the scalpel, the chances of recurrence are less because we are removing the tissue right after the basal uh, cells where these uh, melanocytes are found. And uh, we can expect uh, some good aesthetic results from that. There so are, we prefer uh, surgical rather than laser method now? Uh, yeah, but uh, not every patient prefers that uh, because it uh, leaves a raw connective tissue uh, for this and it's very painful. And some patients may go for lasers and they may do well with lasers also or with prior surgery and with chemicals. But chemicals, the problem is that uh, the, we cannot control the depth of the action of chemicals. That is the problem. So we are not using chemicals. So ma'am, according to you, which, which would be the best method for ginger activity? Uh, for uh, present, the type of uh, pain uh, tolerance that people have, a uh, lot of patients go for the laser type of therapy. Ma'am, if, ma if we have to give crown immediately then? Immediately after, no, that, that area is different. We are not talking about, we can, we can go. Ma'am, which about. type of laser would you prefer? Uh, it is the carbonized or y soft tissue lasers, YAG or uh, diode laser. Does it work well for depigmentation? Diode lasers also well, well, works well. We, we are doing it in our clinics. We are doing it with the diode. And uh, no, we have the only, the yes, only is that people don't like the smell of that uh, burning tissues. Sometimes that is an issue. Otherwise, uh, they they work laser. These diode lasers work well. Uh, okay. We have seen many cases of overextended crown margins and underextended crown margins also. So I would like to ask Dr. Padnabhan sir and Jayashree ma'am, if we have overextended crown margins, how do we uh, counteract that or what are the implications of those? Dr. Jayashree, please. If there are overextended crown margins, uh, we need to replace them and make sure that uh, we, because most of these crown margins are done with the, uh, your, uh, especially in the interproximal area, I think we need to replace them. 
If it is in the labial surface, we probably can trim it and polish it, but not in the interproximal region. Underextended or overextended, I would always think it's always good to do it before you cement it. You have to take a bite wing or a radiograph that uh, shows the interproximal region. If it is underextended, you must send it back to the lab and make sure that you have a very good crown, uh, well-fitting crown. So it is mandatory for us to take radiographs before you cement and after you cement. And if, uh, if there is an overextended crown and you see it before you cement, you can always do some extra oral trimming and uh, adapt it to the dye that they prepare. But uh, under, uh, under extended margins, you have to send it back and get it uh, redone. Pardon me, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, this underextension and overextensions, theoretically, what we are talking is in microns. Will we be able to detect this in the radiographs? Is the question. So, if it is going to be appreciated in the radiographs, it is no more in microns, it is in a much larger scale. So, obviously, as uh, Dr. Jashri was saying, it has to be repeated or it has to be trimmed so that it fits in fine. That means it requires a couple of more uh, x rays and a couple of more visits and a, 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 a temporary cementation for some time, and then remake the x-rays and make sure that the margins exactly fit in. And if it is underextended, as, as Dr. Jayashree again said, there is no questions at all. It has to be repeated. It has to be repeated, number one. Number two is, the again, the what is the extension of this overextended crowns? If you're going to see these overextended crowns and overextended amalgams, and all these articles are somewhere between 1976 and 1989 or 90. There has been a large amount of uh, literature on this overextensions. What is the criteria for overextensions? If you're going to say overextension, it can be classified as a heavy, medium, and low. If you're going to say what is heavy, there is a numerical value for heavy also. If it is more than 50% the interdental space, it is called heavy. And if it has been 25 to 50, it is medium, and less than 20 is supposed to be low. And interestingly, in all the three cases, the amount of inflammation or the, you know, if you analyze the uh, trivicular fluid for uh, uh, TNF alpha or interleukin 6 or 8 or whatever, the, the, the values are not very significant unless it is going to be more than 50%. So overextension as a cause of deterioration of the restoration, I, uh, I, 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 I do not agree as a clinician. As an academician, yes. As an academician, yes. But as a clinician, you know, we are all clinicians at the end of the day, fine. Apart from the fact that we have lots of books and a lot of articles to support our opinions, but we are all basically clinicians and then we have to go according to the requirement of the patient. If the patient says, I, I'm sure Judge Lee will also uh, accept. If the patient says, I want the crown day after tomorrow, uh, you know, like we have to succumb or to that particular pressure and then make sure. You can't say that you wait for another eight more weeks time because there is always another dentist waiting in the next shop to grab this particular patient. As a clinician, if I have to say, I mean, let's, 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 let's face reality. So you have to make some compromise between theory and clinical practice, clinical practice, and there will be an overlap or other compromise on this thing, but most often in hyperextended uh, or uh, you know, overextended uh, situations, we don't come across much of difficulties, but you will certainly come across a lot of problem in underextension. Most important is the fracture. This is going to be a nidus for fracture of the crown at the neck because a rotational failure, as I always tell you, it is a buccal lingual, and this is an area which is totally exposed to the saliva, and becomes this this area has become much much more soggy or much much more softened, and that is the nidus, and that is going to be the fulcrum, and that fractures. So underextension is a double no in my practice. Overextension, I can close my eyes to some extent, to some extent, but not fully. And the most important thing I like to concur with Dr. Jayashree is that bite wings absolute double must before cementation and after cementation for record purpose and also for legal purposes tomorrow if the patient goes for a court.
Also, uh, I would like to add a note. Um, when you're taking a radiograph, especially in uh, metal-based restorations, this uh, uh, underextended or deficient margin can easily be uh, uh, go unnoticed. Especially only in lithium disilicate, mostly it cannot go unnoticed. But most of the radio opaque restorations, it can just go unnoticed unless we are very careful with our uh, angulations of the radiograph. In bite wing X-rays, you generally get to see even the smallest one. Though the again. Uh, the radio opaque materials can mask, but it's more evident in uh, radio lucent materials. I wouldn't say radio lucent, but it's more uh, evident in glass based uh, ceramics. So, in that way, as Dr. Padmanabhan said, yes, with glass based ceramic, there is a resin cement which probably will cover most of the, even the undermined one. But again, we need to see how much of deficiency is there uh, under underextended crown margin is there that can not be completely sealed with your resin based cement. Ultimately, I think we need to get a very smooth surface uh, in the uh, in the junction between the restoration and the uh, you know periodontium so that uh, there is no plaque accumulation and there's no irritation whatsoever to the soft tissue. So with this debate, uh, we come. At, uh, we have uh, come across that the margin should be supragingival, and both the overextended and underextended are no, uh, crown margins are both tolerable. Uh, and uh, so uh, uh, these, uh, so we should take, and also we should emphasize on taking white wing radiographs. Right. So then uh, we talk about the gingival management. Uh, there are various methods of gingival management. I would like to address Dr. Sanjay Tiwari, sir. What are the methods that is most preferable during the cavity preparation, sir? Uh, Dr. Sanjay Tiwari, sir. Uh, no, these are different methods which you have sold, but here I want to, we all know about the methods we can use, you know, reflection when we talk of making a margin in the in the subgenual area we can go for gingivitis retraction. But what I was going through, which, uh, through our books was saying that we have to always ensure that we should not, when we are, whenever we are doing any gingival retraction, when we are placing the margins, we should not injure the periodontium, the connective tissue, the junctional epithelium. My, the, your retraction cord should always be placed in the sulcus only. And as we already please remember, the margins should not be placed more than one millimeter in the, in the sul sulcus. So only that area has to be exposed. So you only apply a force which is not going to irritate the uh, irritate your the, uh, your periodontium, your connective tissue. Because otherwise, all everything will be will be, uh, will be irreversible. Everything will, will will progress. So that is one one thing. And uh, this electro and they, I have read that you know whenever you are doing any retraction, there there are some sort of injury. And, but it is reversible. After one week, it comes reverse, reverse back to original shape. Uh, you have to give a time that whatever injury we have caused, after one week, it's going to be reverse. So that is, uh, I've also read in the, in the student that the junctional epithelium has, has got this, your uh, biological width has got self-restorative capabilities. After five weeks, it comes to, it's back again, re reseals. Whenever, whenever you are detaching it, after five weeks, it comes, it again, reseals the area. Provided, the plaque control is good, provided the margins which you have placed, that is, uh, that has been perfectly, perfectly been, uh, been placed. That's why we always try to avoid doing all the procedure later on. Are, so these things, what I want to add, other things we all, all remember that we have to go for mechanical, chemical, chemical, all these things. And study have found that there's not much difference in this thing. Only thing what makes difference is that when you are going to irritate the gingiva, that has to be remembered that during picking, either placing of any type of cord, whether braided cord, whether with, with, the, with, the, with the simple mechanical cord, it has not to irritate the gingival tissue. That please be remembered. And minimum pressure has to be applied for when we're doing the retraction. Uh, I would like to, uh, Dr. Ramya, ma'am, to please uh, comment on this, ma'am. Yeah. First of all, I think I'm uh, opening my session just now. I thank IACD for this opportunity. And this is a nice way by which we can interact and share knowledge. Now, regarding uh, during cavity preparation, during your restoration, if you want to do gingival management, 
it depends on uh, what sort of situation you have if you have like excess gingival like a gingival overgrowth then we have to think of some surgical method like electro surgery or even lasers lasers would also be good in that regard but if we have normal healthy gingiva i would always say we can go in for retraction cord retraction cord the double zero or the zero retraction cord single cord would be ideal if the sulcus is shallow if the sulcus is deep then you have to think of a double cord technique so retraction cord would be the first choice nowadays we also have other methods we have cordless methods cordless methods wherein you have techniques which will expand the sulcus so those can also be done but the problem with these cordless methods is that they don't they are very passive they don't really retract the gingiva as well as your retraction cord so if you have to use any cordless technique like expasil or magic foam you have to use these along with compression caps so something which will push the Uh, material into the sulcus and expand the sulcus so that it would be easy for you to proceed with your uh, retraction and whatever is the restoration if you want to take an impression for an inlay you can go ahead with the uh, impression technique so basic preference would be for cord where uh, you know cord is uh, where a patient wants something which is uh, less painful and uh, more comfortable you can think of cordless techniques you can also think of lasers diode lasers are now portable handy lasers are there so you can do a you know good uh, retraction gingival truffing by means of diode lasers which is also well accepted by patients because it is painless it causes less discomfort and healing is uneventful it sterilizes the area so that can also be thought of but in a situation where you have some gingival overgrowth which happens happens most of the times when you have like a long standing class 2 situation then you can think of electrocautery or uh, laser otherwise cord would be the best technique uh, ma'am like patients are not uh, comfortable with the surgical procedure so do you uh, do you prefer lasers or the surgery procedure ma'am surgical laser one? is actually better no? laser is uh, the diode laser is a very handy laser because it is portable it is compact in fact it is called as a soft tissue hand piece so and nowadays there are uh, you know a lot of uh, practitioners also and even colleges have diode lasers which are doing the job we have it in our department and we routinely do gingival truffing with uh, diode lasers so that is also a preferred technique we have different techniques of placement single cord and double cord so i would like to ask uh, what are these techniques and uh, which uh, where we uh, where are these indicated ma'am so a uh, single cord generally when we are doing a, keeping a margin in the equigingival or supragingival margin especially in the anteriors i would go with the single cord uh and uh if i need to keep it actually equigingival i would think a uh, double cord is required so in the single cord you place the tuck the cord uh, i prefer knitted cords like ultra pack uh, some of them like braided cords but with the uh, knitted cord you can just tuck them so easily uh, the instrument that you can use should be a non serrated one of course otherwise it will grab it and it will remove it from the sulcus so you tuck it and don't force your angulation of your uh, um, your instrument it has to be towards the tooth so that you don't injure the gingiva too much you tuck the cord from the proximal and there should not be any excess it should the end should be neatly tucked inside once you tuck the cord then you should use your finishing burr to place your margin almost at the same level as your single cord then you place this double cord when the sulcus allows you to place the double cord and you're going equigingival then you place the double cord the double the second cord should be one size larger than the first cord and this cord you should have some excess that is the end should be visible after you place the double cord second cord you cannot use your rotary you should not be using your rotary instrument and you should place it in such a way that you are mildly tucking the uh, your uh, first cord in so once you place that cord and this as i told you this cord is placed only when you place uh, equigingival or slightly subgingival margin so you uh you place this what i do is once i place this cord second cord then we use a uh, bite registration paste the paste generally takes around 2 minutes to set and this this will hold the second cord in place so since we have an uh, slight excess sometimes it comes off with your uh, bite registration paste if it doesn't you slowly tease it out 
after you wet them. If you remove it before, if, you, if it is dry and if you try to remove it, you might cause injury or to the tissue or they, it might initiate certain bleeding. But you wet them and slightly tease it out and then dry it and take an impression. So I, I hope I answered your question. Dr. Jigya, yes, I want to I want to ask you one thing. What yes. would be the technique if it is a thin biotype or a thick biotype? Depending on that, is there any difference in the cord placement? Uh, I would always look at the sulcus depth to place the, uh, the you know because with the second cord you're not applying too much pressure, so it is not going to injure the gingiva as much. Uh, you know, so it doesn't matter whether it is a thin or the thick. Because you're doing we need to restoration. If it is a CAD CAM restoration, the idea of putting in the cord is to expose some amount of unprepared tooth structure. So you need to expose unprepared tooth structure, whether it is CAD or uh, the analog type of uh, impressioning. I, I mean, digital or analog. You need to expose unprepared uh, tooth structure. That is why we place the cord. So I how long can ma'am? How long can we place the retraction board uh, in sulcus? It, sh it should not be there for more than eight to ten minutes. The maximum time it should stay in should be eight to ten minutes. And I've come across literature that uh, leads to certain amount of gingival re uh, recession, the uh, placement of the uh, uh, retraction board. So. So any damage to the tissue, see when we are placing the retraction cord, you need to respect the periodontium fully. So you cannot apply pressure, you cannot use your, uh, uh, your tucking instrument like a probe and keep uh, applying pressure on the sulcus. It has to be applied very delicately and you have to make sure that you don't injure it too much. It has to be very light pressure and just to finish your margin. So you would have prepared your a, a tooth completely and only to finish your margin you use your retraction cord the first retraction cord and the second retraction cord is only slightly to push it laterally your your gingiva is pushed laterally so that it uh, it uh, exposes the unprepared tooth structure does it depend on the type of technique placement technique also the recession which one the recession uh, yes ma'am so I think I, I can add one point in here that if there is recession, we are always going to put the margin supra gingival. You don't need to go that deep. So uh, right. the, the question of retracting a gingiva which is already recessed doesn't come. As Dr. Padmanabhan also said in recession, this is already an injured gingiva. You don't need to go sub gingival. Yes. So uh, are you asking if the if there is a recession afterwards, later on, or during the it is related to a uh, single cord placement or double is there any relation between the placement techniques ma'am uh, no, there, is, there, there is no relation there i, so I in recession, you you are keeping the margin supra gingival you don't need that you are able to uh, see the visible you are the, no ma'am i think i can add thing. in something here you place the double cord only when the sulcus allows it yes yeah, yeah, when you have a deep sulcus then you can place a double cord you don't need to raise the cord. You are so if you look at the picture on the right side, you can see that the second cord is almost on the preparation. It's slightly, it is, it is not almost, it is not going deep into the sulcus. It's exposed. It's uh, um, more coronal to the gingival margin. So we are not tucking it in. We, we, I would always think it is more towards, it's kind of laterally pushing it so that it exposes the um, you know, gingiva, your single first cord is pushing it apically, but your second cord is always pushing the gingival, uh, gingival tissue on the, from the, uh, on the lateral, more, more laterally than apically. I have a question for Dr. Jayashree. Yes. Jayashree, uh, which do you prefer? You would like to do the retraction before the preparations or after the preparations? I finish my preparation and then use the retraction cord, the first retraction cord, and use uh, and only do the finishing with that retraction cord. Yeah. So the, my entire preparation is completed. Only the finishing I do it with the uh, after I place the uh, first retraction cord. After I place the second retraction cord, I don't touch any. I don't use the rotary instrument at all. Yeah, if you use the ratio rotary, you will have a saliva face wash. Yes. <laughs> Yes. 
So, uh, talking about the subgingival caries here, we need a minimum of uh, three millimeters of sound tube structure from the margin of the final uh, preparation to the alveolar crest. So, I would address this to Ra uh, Ramya, ma'am. How do we manage such lesions, ma'am? Yeah, Without, see, uh, you have the subgingival carious lesion. You always have to expose the upper limit of that carious lesion for your restoration to be done properly and for it to be bonded to the tooth structure. So if it is slightly subgingival, you can think of using a retraction cord. That will work well if you have a slightly subgingival lesion. If you have it little more deeper, you can think of laser gingival troughing. After doing your, you know, like checking the depth of the sulcus, you can just do some laser troughing, which will also expose the upper end of that lesion and you can go ahead with the restoration. Now, if it is quite subgingival, extending almost onto the root surface, then you have to elevate a flap. It will be in the form of a mini flap. Or you can even think of using your uh, rubber dam clamp. The number 212 clamp is an ideal one for affording good retraction. And you can use the mini flap on either side of the lesion. You can place a mini flap and then reflect it slightly and then place the rubber dam clamp so, so you get better access to the upper end of that lesion. Sometimes when the lesion is extending further subgingivally onto the root surface, you may have to reflect a full flap and then go ahead with the restoration. So these are the various options that you have. And after that, you will you may also have to consider, like uh, Nymphia ma'am said, you may also have to consider the level of the crestal bone. You will also have to consider that and accordingly do whether some, you, you may have to do some osseous recontouring if required. Ma'am, you so want I, to ask? I have a question yeah, I there. Would, I would like to add one thing that, uh, like you're talking about these research, these uh, caries regions. And uh, like this is on the facial surface. And if you are... Uh, uh, put, uh, you are trying to restore this. Obviously, we will have to, if we need good aesthetics, we will have to go for the flap technique. Now, we are talking about put, placing some uh, material over there and then the gingiva is placed on that. Anyway, we have, we have seen that even if we are doing recession treatment, the type of attachment to the tooth structure is by long junctional epithelium only. Yes. We are yes, not going yes. to have a connective tissue attachment. Yes, so, it doesn't yes. matter actually if we are restoring the aesthetics, we are. Uh, not having that connective tissue attachment and the patient is able to maintain that maintain area. It, yes. Basically, yes. it will be better. We cannot go but, on putting the gingiva just because caries is there. Then the uh, the whole concept of aesthetics will be gone. So we will yeah, have but to, then we have to remove all the caries. That is there. Yeah, the, the, we, we can raise the that. flap, remove the caries, uh, and then do the restoration and then place the flap back. Of, back course, yes. Uh, yes. of course, in such situations, the bone will anyway be in a very apical direction. So we will have soft tissue attachment in that. Ma'am, in this regard, I want to say one thing. Right now, whatever materials we have are biotolerable. They are not totally, you know, compatible with the gingival tissues. Shortly, mm -hmm. we may be getting some bioactive materials. Composites, the bioactive composites are being uh, developed. Some bioactive glass isomers are there with bioglass. So these kind of materials may promote uh, connective tissue and... Uh, yeah, they will be very respectful to the gingival and the periodontal tissues. <laughs> That's what we want. Uh, I would address this question to Dr. Sanjay Tiwari, sir. If we have root caries, uh, how to go about those cases, sir? Dr. Sanjay Tiwari, sir? So, yes, sorry. I, uh, I totally agree here what, what Dr. Ramya has said, Dr. Jashri was saying. But one few things I have to add over here, that whenever you, in such type of lesions, whenever you, have, you, are, you are going towards a root, whenever there is such, such level of situations are there, we have to all, first thing we have to ensure it, that we should be able to attain a good isolation. For that purpose, we are raising the flap. Second thing is that when after placing the margin, how much is the distance from the apical margin of the restoration with the alveolar crest, whether it is after doing bone sounding, whether it's three millimeter or not, that we must ensure it. If it is there, fine, no problem. And thirdly, about the restoration part, but what, what Madam was saying, we are again I'm emphasizing, I told earlier also. I read in the student that it says that the restore is the one of the is the best material. Because of the few reasons, but for the material to be good over here is we require two things that material must have no least polymeric contraction. Composites have got high polymeric contraction. We have got, of course, less polymeric contraction. Composites have come, but we must have least polymeric contraction. We have coefficient thermal expansion, similar to that, that, of, that, that of truth. That we must have to have good polishability. In that way, that's why we are saying, they are saying the restore is good. They are saying here, MTA cannot, MTA like materials, they, Biopty materials cannot be because there are some. We don't want bone to grow over there. We want good periodontal, periodontal 
uh, compatibility has to be there. And again, the study have found that the parental tissue has got better compatibility with the Geristor, that is the light cure glass enamel cement. That is what I is there in the in the fluent which, which I want to, I, 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 to add over there. And lastly, material should be properly finished, polished, so that it does not allow if it is anything that going successfully. It does not allow the plaque deposition. And most important thing is after that, we must emphasize upon good maintenance. In that area, patients should be asked to do good maintenance therapy, which is a good proper plaque, uh, plaque control devices have to be introduced. As an endodontist also, as a, as a respiratory person also, we must introduce good plaque maintenance devices, which should be emphasized, but I, I feel. Yeah, so the general rule is that for a normal dentition, where there are no restorations, there are no irregularities in the dentition, we go for at least two minutes of brushing. So adding one problem, like one restoration, orthodontics, or any other thing, will add, each will add one minute. So you need to emphasize that to the patient, that any additional uh, material or any ad additional irregularity or any additional uh, restoration in the mouth, you will have to add one minute and uh, the method of brushing. And we don't need to completely change the method of brushing in these patients because it's very difficult to develop good me new methods. It's a lifelong habit, which is very difficult to take. So you watch the patient, what he's doing for the maintenance of oral hygiene and then modify only the problematic area. That will be easier for the patient to adapt rather than introducing a very difficult method and then uh, uh, then expecting the patient to for, uh, uh, forget his uh, lifetime habits and introduce a new method. So this is what is about the uh, maintenance part of any uh, uh, mouth where the restorations has to be. Now, this is a case of class to composite restoration. Can I ask one question? Yes, the, the last slide, please, the canine. Yes, sir. To the, to the conservative dentist. Uh, I always come across failures in all these cases. Yes, Even sir. I yes, I would like to answer about this. Yeah, yeah. I, I am not at all successful in all that as yes. a clinician. If I'm you look at it, successful. yes. If you look at it, class 5 restorations are among those restorations which have the highest degree of failure. Probably because the tooth flexes when you bite and the canine region, the flexure is much more. So much the more. possibility of debonding is more, particularly if you use a composite resin. If you're using composite resin also, it is recommended that you use a microfilled or a, a flowable composite rest material because this will have a low modulus of elasticity and it will be able to take up that flexure. But uh, the preferred material here would be glass cyanomer because glass cyanomers are the ones which have much more uh, long-term durability when they are used in class 5 situations because their bond is dynamic. So they don't debond de that easily. So, But most often the failure is in class 5 situations because of the tooth flexure that happens in that region. Would you prefer metallic restoration, say amalgam, okay fine, take that uh, barring the uh, aesthetic into consideration? No you... sir, definitely not. Definitely, Definitely not. not. Now amalgam and other metallic restorations are out. Even uh -huh. in the posterior region, it is out. Uh -huh. For I class mean, 5 situations. I mean, not that I'm using it. But no, I still sir, for I class still, 5 situations, no. I still felt as a clinician, amalgams are one of the best restorative materials. I'm not sorry. for a class 5 situation. So glass uh, numbers uh, are the preferred material. I want to agree with you, uh, with Dr. Padmanabhan. Especially for the for the glass two cavities, the amalgam are still the best. But I personally feel we have been practicing. People are coming to me for amalgam restorations from distant places because the, if we are able to build up good contents and contours, and I have been able to speak to many forum in behalf of DCI regarding amalgam. I don't want to say, but we have to find a substitute for that uh, unless until good positive when we say it can be completely re replaced. But this is not the matter to discuss over here. But here in this condition, amalgam are not indicated. Definitely, we have to go for a light glass and cement, which will be better. But Dr. Rame is saying it has to have a, 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 a composite, besides com composition, not prefer here, the light glass and cement that has to be preferred because of the obvious reasons. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now, if we see this case of class 2 composite restoration, there's a proper marginal integrity and contact in contour. So, I would like to ask uh, uh, what is the significance of? Uh, Marginal integrity and proper contact and conduce sensitive eyes, sir. Uh, Doctor, yes, sir. Uh, see, I was after it, when, uh, for the for these reasons. These are the cases where for build up good contact and contour, we have to use a uh, you know uh, uh, 
the met good good selection of the metrics band has to be there and for uh, first of all we have to attain a good isolation and that to attain a good isolation if margins are sufficient sub we have to we have to think of uh, deep marginal uh, margin elevation things sort of things where we build up the cervical margins with the composites and then we attain a good isolation with the with the rubber dam and after that applying the uh, uh, properly uh, proper uh, 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 proper matrix bands especially the which is the by tendings or sort of things then only we are able to build a good good contrast and contour building for that we have to ensure if you want to build a good contrast and contour one thing more we have just forgotten say one few things the whenever we are doing some restorations kindly ensure that the one thing which we often forget is the placement of the of the wedges for detraction for the, that for prevention of overhang so that good wedging has to be has to be preferred good matrix band not the toffel mire because that will uh, place the, the the sort of flat contact matrix band selection is a very very crucial, crucial thing and we must good do a, having a, a selection of a of a matrix band like pelodent sort of thing and which we ensure that good contacts have been contoured contacts have been attained and then and we start restoring it incrementally so as to build up the good contact and contour and also prevention of the overhang of the margins yeah can i add in dr jigyasa here yes ma'am yes ma'am yeah see uh, in this kind of a situation we normally will not think of doing composite because the contacts are i mean the cavity is quite wide but nowadays we have very good matrices which will give the right uh, contour and we have good matrix bands as well as we have those contact rings the newer contact rings like the v3 rings the v4 rings and you have these uh, garrison composite type uh, rings you know these allow good separation plus they also allow good contour for the proximal surface so you will get the contact at the right location if you using toffelmeyer like sir said your contact will be shifted at a much to a much higher level and it would result in fracture of the restoration over time whereas with these newer matrices you will get the right contour and the wedge here is not to prevent any gingival overhang it, it is going to ensure that there is going to be proper gingival adaptation of the band so that and that is that is the primary role of the wedge because the separation is achieved by means of your contact rings so these are the materials that have to be used to achieve good contact and contour when you have a situation like this and you need to do a class 2 composite restoration so the choice of matrix is very important and the choice of band is also very important in this situation thank you ma'am uh, the, uh, now this we can see that there is a lesion on the uh, which is approaching the subgingival uh, area and uh, this is actually a 5 uh, years old uh, restoration has been done so i would uh, like to ask uh, jeshree ma'am uh, how can you achieve good stabilization and adaptation of a re uh, restoration with a uh, good marginal integrity and adaptation so that uh, biological width violation uh, is not there so i would always think uh, in a rest in a lesion like this which is uh, a class 5 on the proximal when you see a radiograph like this uh, it can it can actually mis it can be misleading because it looks very small but when you actually go in there it's deeper than what it looks so and also it uh, it extends bucco uh, lingually so it's difficult to assess the uh, extension of uh, caries with your radiograph though it is a bite wing so in this case uh, you cannot just approach on the proximal side you have to unfortunately approach from the occlusal itself and when you use a larger matrix the that those are the pallodent plus where you have an extension gingival extension as long as that wing of the pallodent gets beyond the preparation that is after removing the caries it goes beyond uh, at least around a millimeter beyond the gingival margin you will be uh, able to get good uh, marginal adaptation so in these cases you can go in for uh, uh, flowable or the packable flowable along with the packable different types of restorative uh, techniques are there and as long as you get good marginal integration which blends with the tooth i think you will be able to maintain a very good uh, soft tissue and hard tissue health and what about how do we achieve uh, proper bonding in such uh, areas so uh, 
see these days uh, you don't you don't have uh, your bonding agent has very good bond strength even with the dentin so when you go as deep as that you probably don't have any enamel left at all so your bonding is totally uh, obtained with your uh, with the bonding agent so uh, i uh, personally prefer uh, if i'm going for a single uh, bond then i would always like the tetric and universal pen which is it goes in really deep and it has a very very thin brush so it can go reach the entire uh, corners of the cavity or i would also uh, in some situations i also like to use clearfill sc uh, which is a, a sixth generation two step so it has a uh, you can etch and bond in two different steps so yeah. bonding agent should not be an issue at all um i remember like thinking about this yeah i think tot uh, total etch is not uh, preferred in these situations uh, self etch because as you go deep you know, self etch is a better uh, approach for bonding agents here and if you look at the contact there you see that how uh, it is a nice broad contact unlike uh, what you could get with the tofelmeers so this will also help you if you look at the gingival the radiolucent triangle there which is just enough for the tissue probably the soft tissue to adapt so i think uh, you can attain very good um, uh, you know contact points with pallodent matrices which is used here it's a Uh, so yeah. uh, and also like if it is JC. yes yeah one thing i would like to add here is if this is a situation where you have some amount of gingival recession you yes. can also approach it from the buccal or the lingual side yes but uh, uh, of the doing an occlusal approach you can also think of that because with magnification if you do it it would be you can do like this type of an external tunnel restoration but uh, but it will be difficult to apply the matrix you will always you will probably and the you finishing you can place the matrix from the occlusal end and then you can uh, adapt it well because if if it is pretty deep and there is some amount of gingival recession i'm not saying in a normal situation where you know the gingiva is fine in the situation where you have some amount of gingival recession because cutting through a healthy marginal ridge to reach that lesion can be avoided if you can approach it either from the buccal aspect or from the lingual aspect that can also be tried in the situation so in, in my experience uh, where there is a proximal class 5 lesion uh, with my uh, I, i have always not been able to obtain very good uh, uh, adaptation of the um, uh, your restorative material when i take a radio for all our uh, cases we always take a post op radiograph after we finish the restoration and i always see that we are not able to adapt well and also uh, finishing becomes a ma major issue in especially the proximal class 5 lesions and that is why i am telling you again, only in those situations where there is some amount of gingival recession okay so if there is recession then only you can do this yeah so uh, it didn't work with me maybe it will work with uh, many of them but uh, uh, it's more this this type for me is more predictable compared to the class 5 and the proximals for me it has been predictable tiwari sir would you like to say something about this uh, again i want to emphasize that you can do restoration of these cases without without raising the flap if you are able to attain the isolation first important thing isolation secondly thing what dr dr jashri has said your matrix band has to pass through through that lesion go beyond that lesion if you are able to go beyond that that's why we go for a more modified of my band for in, in the technique of, of the deep margin elevation if we are able to attain that thing that's fine otherwise it says we have to raise the flap we have to do and uh, attain proper isolation then only any for any composite restoration restoration isolation is most important in these lesions one of the most difficult problem is the isolation and when we are able to attain some isolation then we can raise this gingival label after that we apply the rubber dam and then we do the rest of the restoration with the with the pallodent or, or or this type of ring or vt type of type of the bands but important thing is that there we have to ensure it what dr jashri said i agree with her that you know in these condition this is very easy to say we can restore it like that but when you restore it whether when during that preparation part whether uh, whether we are able to attain isolation or not and thirdly see here the pockets are quite deep so conditions are not very good very healthy here so for any restoration when you are doing any restoration kindly see to it that before that gingival health should be maintained just don't rush for immediate restoration 
do good research in genetic my, my good uh, parental therapy take the opinions once they come sound state then you start thinking of the, uh, restoring it so that during the process bleeding is not there proper isolation is attained and then you think of good restoration otherwise everything exercise goes to tight uh, again a case of subgingival restoration so uh, we come across such cases in our day to day practices and uh, uh, we uh, face a challenge or during the uh, treating such patients, the operative challenges, isolation challenges. So there's a technique co uh, for the coronal margin uh, relocation, which is uh, the deep margin elevation. So I would uh, like to ask uh, Ramya ma'am, what uh, uh, is this technique? Yeah. And the yeah. Actually, this deep margin elevation is a new terminology for what has been originally called as open sandwich technique. What was introduced by McLean as open sandwich technique using glass isomer has been modified and that is now evolved as your deep margin elevation. You also call it as cervical margin relocation. Now here, the idea is not to do a gingival uh, a surgical procedure when you have a cavity which is extending a little more subgingivally. In these situations, what is done is you, you are trying to relocate that margin at a, to a more supragingival level. It is normally done in two steps. And for this, you need to use a lot of magnification. Without magnification, this deep margin elevation doesn't happen and well, you have to have good access to the proximal area of the tooth. And if there is some gingival overgrowth or if there is some gingival inflammation, that has to be controlled first before you do this deep margin elevation. In case there is some gingival overgrowth, you can do some gingivectomy or you can do some gingival truffing procedure, play some retraction cord. And then this deep margin elevation is now done using uh, composite resins, flowable composites are the materials that have been recommended for this. You can use a combination of flowable and you can use a combination of, uh, along with that, you can use a viscous composite as a snowplow technique, wherein you can use the flowable as the base layer and then you can use a viscous composite over it and then co cure it together as the snowplow technique. So the important thing here that you have to notice, like Dr. Sanjay said, you have to have very good access to the region. You have to have very good isolation. You have to have control over the gingival bleeding or gingival fluid that can accumulate over there. Once that is done, the first step is to relocate that margin to a more uh, supra-gingival level, to a, so, to a equi-gingival or a slightly supra-gingival level. Once that is done, then you can think of doing either a direct composite or an indirect uh, ceramic restoration. Depending on the choice of the patient or the operator, you can decide which, rest, which type of restoration can be done. But the important thing that has to be remembered here is that the margin has to be, once you have done the relocation, the composite restoration's margin, the global composite or the viscous composite's margin should be totally smooth. It should not irritate the gingiva in any way. So that is what is going to ensure that the periodontium is going to return back to normal. And the thing is here, clinically you will have, there are many cases, this has been done by Dr. Pascal Manny and it has been proposed by uh, Dichi. So th these are uh, techniques which this technique has a follow-up of cases for over 8 to 12 years. But uh, the important thing that you have to remember is clinically you can, it, is, it has been proven to have very good results. But uh, histologically, if you see, you only have a junctional epithelium. You only have a, sorry, long junctional uh, epithelium. There is no connective tissue formed over the restoration because these materials are still not biocompatible. They are uh, biotolerable. They are not biocompatible. So you, there may be not be probing depth. Another thing that you have to remember here is you have to use an interdental brush to see that you maintain proper oral hygiene. That is important. So the patient has to be very conscientious and he has to maintain good oral hygiene. Only then this kind of a deep margin elevation will work. And the dentist should do it totally under strict isolation and proper magnification. These things are important. Uh, so uh, I've come across that uh, these, uh, this technique proves the marginal seal. So Sivarisa, uh, would you emphasize on this? That how does, uh, whether it improves the marginal seal or not? Uh, see, again, uh, about the marginal seal, it all depends on about composite part. Of course, they are saying what Madam has said, it is a modified technique of the open sandwich technique where we, earlier we are using carcinomer cement, now we are using composites. Composites always have a drawback of some sort of polymeric contraction. We cannot verify it. Again, that's why the posture on this, what Dr. Badmanav was saying about the amalgam, placing amalgam over the deep portion or even the metal restorations later on going for good partner finish, everybody's saying. So they have to, they are, 
they are method to be uh, to be debated. Uh, but Dr. Ramya is saying they have got a follow up of, of 12 years. Fine, but they have to be seen in in, in the long term. Yes, but, sir. Uh, but we but we are saying it is all individual the clinicians and choice for such reasons. Uh, what restoration he want to he want to prefer. And one thing here, see, when we are talking of of any marginal finish, I just want to ask one question from Dr. Padnav. That see, Madam was also saying, Dr. Jashi was saying that when we check the margins, I was going through that marginal finish gap should not be more than 25 micron in power restoration. And when we are using the probe, we can only detect a gap of around 65 micron. Should we use also probe for checking the marginal finish? Because when we are using the inlays in our time, and I pass my BDS, MDS. We have to check the marginal finish with the inlay, with the probe, and check how much the finish is there. Should we check the margin for marginal finish? Probe should be used for checking the marginal finish in, in this case or not? How can we verify that the restoration has been properly finished or not? So there is something called clinical error, which is acceptable. So if you are planning for uh, uh, an absolute zero uh, contact between the restoration and the tooth, it is going to be utterly impossible. Even if you're going to use castables, or even if you're going to use gold, there will be a very minimal amount of exposure. And if you're going to use the probe, that's the only way by which you will be able to find out whether there is a marginal discrepancy. If you're able to find out with the help of a fresh, new, sharp probe, that obviously means there is a discrepancy. And we can only use maybe a, a finishing bar or a, 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 a 40 fluted uh, tungsten carbides to uh, you know, smoothen the area and then make it flush if you're going to use a noble alloy. If you're not using noble alloys, if you're using materials like uh, lithium disilicates, we have to totally depending, depend on the looting material to seal the gap. I don't think there is any way by which you will be able to totally get an absolutely zero uh, gap between the restoration and the uh, tooth. So here I would like to emphasize that the role of oral hygiene is more important. Interdental brushes play an important role in maintaining. Obviously, block control, all these things are going not to, no, no, these are all going to only uh, reduce the amount of block control. Ultimately, what are we talking about periodon shem and ultimately what are we uh, concerned about block control? If you're not able to get the block control, you have to use additional methods like uh, interproximal brushes or uh, uh, you have to use some water floss or something like that to make sure that that particular area is cleansed. I think uh, uh, oral hygiene and uh, you know, like uh, plaque control is the mantra for uh, preventing, uh, preventing any secondary decay or uh, gingival. Uh, you can also think of water picks here. Water yeah, picks I, are also useful. In this. Would like I have done a study on the water picks and uh, uh, I will uh, share with you that it reduced the number of patients where we had to go for study. So that is the amount of uh, plaque control that water pick is able to do. And in uh, the foreign countries, you will see that in every uh, washroom, they will have a water pick for everyone. And it's really a uh, very uh, useful method, particularly for the patients who are compromised from the point of view of having a restoration or any other uh, irregularities in the mouth. But I would like to ask uh, uh, one question. As a clinician, how long do you take, how much time do you take for all this restoration? Your procedures seems to be extremely elaborate and uh, especially if you're going to use magnification, I think you're going to use at least about one and a half hours to two it hours. It will take time, it will take time. It will definitely take time. Yeah, it looks, it looks, it looks, it looks very difficult. Okay, I'm basically a metal man. So I would always prefer to go in for a noble alloy uh, inlay rather than uh, a restoration like this. Maybe you're conservative, absolutely fine. But uh, these patients want tooth colored, everything to be tooth colored. They don't want any more that, metal in there. Yeah, Even all ceramic crowns are there. They, they don't want metal ceramic. So, as far as restorations are concerned, they want it all to be tooth colored, not metal. Very true, absolutely true. And uh, uh, do you vouch that uh, this uh, 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 the, 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 uh, monolith? Or the best material. I think it is not the best material when it, when, when you compare that with. We have uh, very little literature to support. No, so I would. I would like to. Uh, I would like to add there, sir. Your monolith is very good material. Uh, I have been using it for probably since 2010, and uh, I would vouch for it. 
And as long as you have enamel to bond, it could be in the form of a collar around the tooth, like in the on lace, or it could be full enamel. It is, it's an amazing material because you can bond one thing. You can actually, the marginal, if you look at the marginal seal that the resin cement gives you, the finish that you can get, an insoluble resin uh, seal, I think it's an amazing material. But like every material, it is technique sensitive. It requires a, a good reduction, the specific reduction, and moreover, good isolation and enamel. In, as long as you have good enamel, and of course, occlusion. We need to take care of occlusion. If the occlusion is not good, then it can fail. So I think it's a very good material, lithium disilicate. Uh, and I, we are talking about uh, monolith zirconiums, not disilicates. Yeah, disilicates, you can etch and bond and things like that. Yes, but yes. Not zirconiums, they are, uh, in, my, in my hands, maybe I'm not good, maybe I'm not good. In my hands, it doesn't, uh, I'm, not, I'm not extremely happy about using that as a, a single crown restorative material, especially when there is a limited axial length of the crown. Uh, not very happy about it. Anyway, differs. It, it differs. Clinicians differ. Clinicians do differ. Jigya, sir, we can go to the next slide. We can move to the cervical carious lesion, ma'am. Yeah. So, uh, like sir was talking about jelly store. Uh, so, I would ask uh, Ramya, ma'am, and or Sanjay Tiwari and Sanjay Tiwari to. Uh, what type of restorations and what type of restorative metal are best suitable for such conditions? Sir, can answer first? Well, I have already spoken, given my yeah. views about Sir, the I would, my, my choice would be glass ionomer. My choice of glass ionomer would be Fuji to LC. Your, uh, Fuji is the company, GC is the company that I prefer my glass ionomers to be from. So, uh, uh, Fuji. Light cured is the material that I would prefer here. Resin modified glass ionomers are definitely preferred for class 5 lesions because they are more compatible. They release fluoride and uh, the gingiva, they, they produce, you can produce a smooth surface. So there is not much of plaque addition. So these are the materials of choice because they bond well and they also release fluoride and uh, they are also aesthetically pleasing. These are the materials of choice. Jerry Store is one material which has been used for uh, perforation repair for, uh, uh, you know, for, for when there is a focal perforation or uh, used as a retrofilling material also, and it has produced a very good response from the periodontal tissues. So as far as this material is concerned, it is a very good material. So resin modified glass ionomers are primarily the materials of choice for uh, cervical lesions and even for uh, any uh, root carriers lesions in the accessible areas, in the accessible areas. In the posterior regions, it would be a, 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 a reinforced glass ionomer like miracle mix or cermet ionomer that I would prefer. Uh, but besides that, we, again, I want to repeat it, that it has got coffee and thermal expansion similar to that of truth. And plus, they, this shrinkage is there. That's why it is, um, these things are, this material is, is choice. And we can go to the next slide. Again, for the known carrier cervical lesion, I think same treatment of choice will be yeah. good. Now, if you talk about the overhands, so they have been implicated to uh, again violate the uh, biological weight. So, I think uh, Nymphia ma'am will agree to this statement that they uh, violate the biological weight overhand. Ma'am, Nymphia ma'am? Yeah, uh, overhangs, of course, we don't like overhangs. Periodontists will never like overhangs. Uh, but uh, the thing is that we have to look at the bone. If this can be maintained, but uh, not this uh, this amount of over, over, uh, this overhang. A little bit of overhang we can definitely manage with a good oral hygiene. But if it's completely filling and obliterating the gingival embrasure, then it's either impinging on the gingiva and uh, that will lead to the inflammation of the gingival uh, papilla and ultimately there will be loss of the bone. But uh, if it's minimal and uh, it's within the confines, it's not much beyond the confines of the tooth and more coronary, then uh, it can be maintained over a period of time. See if the restoration has been done and it has a bit of overhang and we can we first try to manage it with a good oral hygiene and if the patient is able to maintain that hygiene, rather than going for more extensive procedures and removing that and giving new crown and then uh, risking the fracture of the tooth or uh, risking the loss of the tooth material, uh, we would first like to maintain that if it's in the more coronal direction. But if it's uh, very much near the bone and it's uh, continuously trying to have a difficult plaque control in that area and leading to the bone loss, we would definitely uh, like to replace it. Uh, Jashree, ma'am, would you like to emphasize on this?
Ram, your mic is off. Your Hello. mic is put off, ma'am. Yeah, kindly unmute, madam. Kindly unmute. Yeah. So as I told, definitely overhangs are a big no, and it has to be uh, ma made sure that we have good restorations with good marginal fit. Anything okay. that uh, irritates the tissue will eventually have long-term, um, uh, you know, effects that we need to make sure that it is good marginal fit. Can yeah. I add in something here, Jigya sir? Yes, ma'am, please. Yeah, it does not, like the plaque that collects around this is going to be, you know, causing more of periodontal disease. It's more of gram-negative anaerobes. So that is also a cause for concern. Plus, it can also cause secondary caries in that region as well as in the, it, it can cause a new carious lesion in the adjoining tooth. So this kind of an overhang, if it is so large, it is better. This is not acceptable. This is too much of an overhang. Too much, yeah, it is not acceptable. Too much of an overhang. Some of extent you can, you can tolerate maybe 0.5 millimeter yeah. or so. But not this kind of. Uh, yeah, you have ways of addressing minimal overhangs. You have these oscillating devices, your profin handpiece, which you know, which uh, oscillates and removes overhangs. If there is very slight overhang, then these kind of devices can be used. And I read somewhere recently that you also have certain micro scalpels. If you have overhangs in a composite restoration, you have some new micro scalpels which have been uh, developed from micro uh, uh, surgical instruments for ophthalmology. These can be used to trim the overhangs without causing any damage to the tooth structure or to the gingiva. So those kind of things, but of course- if But at the same time, you will have to take care of the contact point also. Maintaining yes. the contact point yes. is very important because otherwise there will be occlusal food impaction. Yes. Now, I want to add one thing because so, so many of the students are there. Prevention is always better than the better cure. Than cure yes. yeah. Prevention yes. is always better than the cure. Please make it a practice that to you use apply a proper wedge. good proper wedge. Good. We are not using that wedges. We talk of very big things. Please for restoring good good wedge, good, good wedges. If uh, and secondly, what I I again want to you know reiterate uh, what Dr. Jashri has said. Please ensure after every restoration, go for good biting X-rays. Make it a practice because if after sometimes somebody sees this this type of thing now. It is going to be totally unacceptable. We cannot do anything. We have to face the risk. So we have to, and, and it's not like that. We, we cannot, even a very experienced person can, can commit these, these things. If you are not use the, using the, if you are in a hurry, if you are not using the proper, proper wedges, anybody can do, can do these, these things. So for checking that thing, kindly see to it that, take a good biting x-rays, and ensure if it is there, kindly repeat the restoration. No need of leaving this for this thing and talking about big thing. Again, repeat it, good, do good restoration, Put again, again wedge and ensure it that it's not overhang, then you go for final restoration. To avoid overhang, we should have proper metricing, uh, proper wedge placement, and we should uh, ensure a bite, wing, uh, to, a bite wing radiograph to be taken. So the next, uh, this slide I have put because there is an, uh, we can see in the, uh, on the right side that there is a cement dislodged in the interproximia. So uh, during the procedure, it must have got dislodged. So how can, uh, Jayashree ma'am, I would add, like to address this to Jayashree ma'am. How do, can we prevent this uh, type of scenario, that cement which has been dislodged in the interproximal area before setting? Ma so here, um, uh, it's always mandatory that when we use a floss, after using the floss, uh, uh, after all your, uh, once the restoration is there, you check the contact points and with your radiograph, you check the marginal uh, fitting you have to use your floss. When you use your floss, after flossing, you need to flash cure on the four corners of the tooth so that the cement, your resin cement, will just uh, set enough for you to dislodge the uh, setting cement. Once it's dislodged, again, you need to use the floss in such a way that it, you can pull out all the uh, unset, completely unset uh, resin cement. And you also have these uh, CVW, which is a very tiny, uh, uh, tiny instrument, which passes through the interdental space and you can dislodge these cements very easily. And only after you completely remove it, then you have to do the final curing. And it is important for you to take radiographs even after the final uh, cementation to make sure these uh, remnants of cement are not there especially in resin-based cement, it's very, very difficult for you to remove those cements once it is completely set. You can use an ultrasonic scaler to some extent, but it will probably not dislodge completely. And uh, uh, if at all, 
if you're using a self-adhesive cement, it is much easier for you to remove the cement, but resin-based cement, it's very difficult. So it is very, very technique sensitive. Like Dr. Padmanabhan said, yes, when you do a lithium disilicate, you have to follow many steps and you have to have much more patience compared to your uh, metal restorations. So this is definitely a big no. You could have some, uh, you know, here the patients probably will not even be able to floss properly to maintain the periodontal health of, in the interproximal region. Ramana, would you like to say something? Yeah, like she said, uh, you have to cure it minimally so that the cement just hardens. And then you have to dislodge the cement before you proceed with final curing of the restoration. Always make sure that you take x-rays to check, you know, if there is any excess cement. And you may, you, in these situations, you can use the floss to dislodge it or before it sets completely. Or you can also think of using your interproximal strips, which can try to dislodge it before the cement completely hardens. So you get something called an, uh, uh, you know, contact breakers, which has a little saw at the tip of the blade. You can just rock it in between the uh, interproximal region, which can actually dislodge the cement. If you use any kind of strips that has uh, abrasive on both sides, you could open up no, the contact. No, you have single-sided strips. strips, no? So you have you single-sided should... strips. Yes, so you have a special saw-like material, which has a blade with a little saw at the tip. So you got to rock it so the both sides will be smooth. The tip will be, the cutting edge will be a, like a very fine saw. So that is very useful for you to rock it and then you can remove it. Yeah, it's called the Siri saw. It is yes. called Siri saw. We normally use it. But uh, the most important thing here is after the flash tear, yes. the direction in which you're going to push the excess material is the most, most important thing. If you're going to push it more currently, there is a bright possibility of the whole restoration coming off also. So you have to be very, very careful while removing it because you don't dislodge a restoration. And uh, the direction of the force that you're going to generate to remove the excess is very, very important as well as it has to be very, very gentle. So you don't dislodge the whole run fully. Yes, I agree. Right. I agree. It has to be on the, pro on the buckle side or on the lingual side. So when we talk about the proximal contacts, either we have a broad contact or a too narrow contact. So if we have to do a restoration uh, in a broad contact, which is a subgingival uh, caries lesion, uh, how, how should we go about that? Uh, I would like to address this to Dr. Sanjay Tiwari, sir. Contact with the contact part have all, has already been discussed. We have to see that whether, uh, first of all, the, we have to see the margins, whether the margins are there whether we are able to attain the proper, proper isolation or they are not. If not able to attain the proper isolation, then we have to go, uh, go for deep, this deep margin elevation sort of technique. If it's possible, how much is it extending? Now, after that, we have to go, use a good, uh, good uh, select a uh, good uh, uh, your matrix bands, especially the colorants or, uh, or anything which uses the biting principle which causes the... the so those things have to be said, good selection of the materials, good selection of the bands, that has to be done and I attain an attainment of proper isolation, then we can build up this, this contact very well. And of course, for me, uh, such type of restorations, uh, because we have been trained to do the inlays, we would prefer to do a good contact with that. Uh, if we prefer to go for a inlay restoration in such cases to, be, uh, to build up the good uh, physiologic contacts and contours. For me, uh, for my age people, because we are not using more uh, nowadays this your know, inlays, but we have been trained to use inlays in our system. So we would prefer, in such cases, for building the physiologic contact control, we would prefer to make suspicion posterity the inlays. We will be preferring it. Yeah, you have these newer matrices, no, which will get the right location of the contact and contour. So those type of matrices, if you're doing a composite restoration, you can go in for your uh, composite type uh, soft string uh, type of matrix and you can go in for V3 matrix. These are the things, or even the bioclear matrix, which also, which is a, you know, a celluloid matrix, which allows light transmission, and you will be able to get good contour and good contact. Those are the things if you have, if particularly have a broad contact and you need to reestablish it properly while doing your composite restoration. These are the newer ones. And a lot of studies have been done on these materials and they have proven to be really successful. So, you know, they get the right 
location of the contact and contour. And uh, not only that, they do not cause any gingival irritation. The long-term health of the periodontium is also ensured. So these type of devices can be employed to achieve the right contacts and contours when you have large proximal lesions. Uh, uh, here, I just want to add, madam. See, as per clinical experience, when you're using this, this bite endings and this, this your, you know, uh, uh, dead soft uh, materials. Sir, for there are now newer mattresses, sir. There are now newer mattresses which have got a nylon coating which makes them more stiffer. Plus, they also have a gingival extension. So, if you have like a subgingival uh, situation, they would adapt well to the subgingival contours of the tooth also. So, they will have the right contour. And they would, and they are also, you know, they, they mimic the right uh, buccolingual and the occlusal gingival contour of the tooth on the proximal side. So those mattresses can be used. Whereas the original palodent mattresses are very uh, thin and they are very delicate. Even holding it with your teaser is going to result in kinking or damage to the band. That doesn't happen with the newer bands which have been introduced uh, some seven to ten years ago. So those kind of bands can be employed. So. Uh, Padmanabhan sir, if there is a broad contact and we are doing the prosthetic restoration, we are placing a crown. So they, the, it becomes an over contoured crown. So how do we manage that, sir? Inevitable. It is absolutely inevitable. It is an over contoured crown. We have to accept it. Simple as that. I mean, you cannot keep an open contact in that particular situation. The idea is the uh, mesio distal width has to be closed. And uh, the second thing is, if you're going to analyze the contact over a period of time, Contact in the LA younger patients will be more in the middle third of the crown and there will be an occlusal embrasure as well as a, a gingival embrasure. But as the patient ages, maybe when he's about 60, 65, the occlusal embrasure is going to be much, much more lesser and so is the gingival. So that means there is going to be a huge broad contact area. In this particular situation, if you're going to give a crown, it will be over contoured and it is inevitable there will be a little amount of uh, gingival inflammation we have to inform the patient so in these cases i would always prefer uh, i mean i'm not a direct indirect restorative uh, man i'm not i'm certainly not a direct restorative man i'm more an indirect restorative man i would always prefer uh, a, 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 a precious alloy inlay otherwise if, you, if the patient insists and if he has to essentially go for a tooth color restorations I would rather go in for um, a, a, a material which abrades. I would like not to go in for, uh, uh, you know, like monolith zirconiums and things like that. I would like to go which abrades a little bit so that even in there, there's going to be a very tight contact over a period of time because of the mobility of the tooth it is going to contour itself. I need contouring of the uh, proximal contact over a period of time so that the contact is tight, optimum and it does not allow any irritation or food stagnation subgingivally because that is going to be the nidus for periodontitis and the loss of respiration as well as the tooth. So if there is going to be over contouring, there is no alternative at all. You cannot uh, think in terms of doing a root canal, doing a two uh, premolars rather than a, I mean, all those things is not in the books of, uh, what do you call it, uh, clinical dentistry, certainly not in the clinical dentistry. So. I always feel if there is going to be over contouring, we see distally proximally, yes, it is going to be. We have to inform the patient and make sure that particular area is cleansed properly. Yes, ma'am, you want to say something? Uh, I would agree uh, with uh, Dr. Pradmanabhan. Yes, there could be. But I would also look at if there is a flat contact on the adjacent tooth where there is some amount of uh, uh, heart tissue loss. I would uh, restore both of them so that they get ideal contour. Okay, ma'am. So we come across such cases in our day-to-day -day practice, and all such cases lead to violation of the biological width. So the procedure which comes to my mind uh, to avoid such thing is crown lengthening. So uh, now I would uh, like to ask: When do we uh, direct crown lengthening for direct and indirect uh, restoration, Nymphia, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, here we uh, we have been talking about the thin and thick gingival uh, contour and we have been talking about the biological width. Now talking about the crown lengthening, we have to take into consideration the attached gingiva also. So it will depend upon how much attached gingiva this, uh, there is and how much tooth structure we need, how much the respiratory dentist wants, how much tooth structure has to be 
provided for a good retention form. So if uh, we have to compromise a lot of uh, the bone support for the root structure, I think uh, you can have post and core and not go for uh, too much of the ground lengthening uh, so that the compromised uh, support system is there. So in these cases, if there is uh, enough of attached gingiva and the crest is uh, very apical, then we can go for gingivectomy, which is the most predictable procedure because now these tissues, they will blend over the bone and you get a very good uh, post-stop healing and post-stabilized tissues over there. And uh, if we have the lack of attached gingiva, we would uh, like to go for the uh, apically placed flap or uh, we will uh, like to uh, we will try to save the gingiva and uh, we will go for the flap technique. We will not go for the external gingivectomy, we will go for the flap technique and we would write, uh, like to uh, see the bone. If the bone has to be removed, then it's only flap. If the bone doesn't have to remove, they remove then we have a choice between gingivectomy and flap technique. But if the, the bone relocation has to be done, we have to see whether this patient uh, is of a high crest, uh, low crest or uh, the medium crest. Accordingly, if we have to maintain that three millimeter of the distance, we will have to think about going for the flap or uh, going for the apiclean crest, going for the normal conventional flap or the apiclean crest. So here we have we to take uh, yeah? How long do we wait after the crown lengthening procedure? Or See, we have to, that same thing happens, that uh, the epithelium heals within three, four days and the connective tissue healing is complete within six weeks. If we see about the cross linking of collagen, it takes about six weeks uh, for the, this thing. So six weeks is the minimum period for any type of healing. When we look at the tissues, they should look uh, healthy. Uh, in the initial phases of the healing, there will be uh, budding of the new capillaries and there will be redness of gingiva. And if we look at the tissues at the six weeks, the excess of those uh, vessels, that budding uh, vessels, angiogenesis is there for the healing, they will retract and then there will be normal uh, pink, coral pink looking gingiva. And at that time, we think that healing is complete. And in that period, between that healing period of six weeks, we don't have to probe that area, we don't have to do anything in that area. Uh, thank you, ma'am. So this is a case where uh, crown lengthening procedure was done. So I would, uh, I would like to ask Sanjay Tiwari, sir, whether crown lengthening was uh, favorable or we should have gone for orthodontic extrusion. See, uh, here I want to add a few things. We have been doing lots of crown lengthening because we have got very good, very good uh, parental department, department of periodontics in our college who supports us for crown lengthening. And we have found a very, very successful thing. See, crown lengthening part basically is being done because for any restoration su successful, we have to have a good ferrule. Ferrule is the portion which is going, going to provide the most, uh, most important factor for resistance from other, other crowns. So ferrule around 2 millimeter ferrule is important. So that is the margin. From that, if your bone support, bone margin distance is, uh, you are able to have the distance after doing bone sounding, 3 millimeter distance is there. If it is there, if it's not there, then we have to go for ground lengthening. Otherwise, we have to just check that way whether, whether that distance is there or not. So crown lengthening basically is being done to keep the margins a distance from the margins to the, uh, to the alveolar crest level. At least three level margins has to be there. Second problem is that initially the question was asked that how much crown lengthening can be done. We have to see here in these cases that after doing crown lengthening, after placing the margins, whether proper adequate crown root ratio is there or not. If one is one ratio is not there, if you in compromised condition, then we have to think of some other options. Third is, option is about the orthodontic exclusion. Orthodontic exclusion is also possible. There are two ways of rapid exclusion as well as the, uh, for, uh, the uh, one is the slow exclusion, second is the rapid exclusion. So I have read so many things. We, we apply around 30, 30 gram pressure for the rapid exclusion and 50 gram pressure with the, but when we are doing the rapid, when we are doing the slow exclusion, then the gingiva also, also you know, uh, comes along with the exclusion. So margin of gingiva comes comes uh, more coronary in, 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 as compared to the adjacent tooth. So that is a problematic. So people have recommended, this was, this was recommended in way back in 72 technique, still very popular in 72. But now they are, then they say about the, about the rapid exclusion, but they apply around 50 gram force. But they have recommended it to also always go for a supra gingival, uh, supra crystal fibrotomy. Every weekly fibrotomy has to be done. So the, because they say in four weeks, the fibers gets rearranged. They don't want to get it rearranged. They do, they, they, they do the fibrotomy, weekly fibrotomy. Up, they apply pressure also, weekly fibrotomy also for three to four weeks. 
and then in four weeks they attain the attain the come to come to your to, uh, to that level. But main drawback of orthodontic exclusion is that one is for posterity that we can expose the furcation for posterity. There we don't go. They have not recommended it as per books the, the orthodontic exclusion. Second problem with orthodontic exclusion is that this need a it need a stabilization of up to up to six months. Third problem with orthodontic exclusion is that there can be a resorption. There can be mobility also. So we have to keep all those things in the mind that what we want to say. Everything has got pros and cons, and the individual cases we have to select it. We have to remember it. Orthodontic exclusion is good, appears to be good, but it has got drawback. One is that gingival label may be disturbed, or that we have to do another another gingival surgery. Secondly, it can also be associated with the some sort of resorption, some sort of mobility also that has to be that has to be seen. So in individual cases we have to see, but 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 we are going to prefer. So can it be a combination of uh, surgical? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that is what that is what a good clinician will do it. That is what a good clinician will do it. They have to they have to assess it that we have actually when we are doing the orthodontic exclusion, it has to always be associated with the, with the combination of some sort of gingival because margin is changing or even fibrotomy also is sort of some sort of gingival surgery is there. So that we have to see that we have got good parental support who has going to contour the things and then we go for it. But I must tell you, we have found this. We have. Uh, we have it's a time of endodontist and the implant people. We have we have done so many cases of your know, down lengthening and they are do, doing so well. Uh, they are giving good aesthetics, uh, especially for those who cannot afford to go for implants because we have got uh, social distance is not good. We are in, we are in typical government setup. We have found a very excellent result with, with the down lengthening procedure. Provided we have done a proper treatment planning. Even also, the exclusion is also very good. Probably we have done a good treatment planning, good stabilization. But if you are not doing, doing doing a good stabilization after orthodontic exclusion, it is going to relapse. So these things have to be have have to be thought and kept in mind. Uh, so, Padmanabhan, sir, what about the crown root ratio in such cases? It will be jeopardized. It will be jeopardized. There is absolutely no doubt about it. You know, your crown root ratio. But uh, I would uh, like to agree with Ramya when she said. A combination of uh, uh, extrusion as well as gingivectomy or surgical procedure is an ideal situation because when you extrude orthodontically, especially uh, with a slow process, it also brings down the periodontium. So the loss of uh, uh, bone support is going to be very, very minimal. There is going to be uh, encroachment of crown root ratio, which is not going to be very favorable. But however, however, this crown root ratio is, uh, you know, like uh, minimal reduction is going to be very well managed. But again, it depends upon the tooth. If it is going to be a canine, it is going to be crucial. If it is going to be lateral incisor, it is going to be less crucial because the uh, proprioception and the amount of forces, direction of the forces, dimension of the forces, all these things matter. So if you're going to take care of the occlusion also, I think the restoration should uh, uh, service for quite a, a long time. I don't think there should be a problem. So like in this case, you, uh, we, uh, now you were talking about uh, occlusion, sir. Now this again is a case of crown lengthening. And uh, we can see that there, uh, though we don't have a, a posterior, a pick of the posterior uh, teeth, but I think occlusion is compromised here. So in such cases, what is the treatment procedure, sir? Uh, unfortunately, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to comment fully, but uh, taking only in the seven teeth, which is seen in the uh, picture, if this is yeah. where to be the clinical picture, I assume that there are no posterior teeth or the posterior teeth have uh, lost their anatomy. There is a collapse of the vertical dimension. So I, in this particular situation, I would like to increase the vertical dimension so that we'll be able to create a better overjet and overbite. And then I would proceed with the uh, restoration of the rest of the teeth also. I am not going to look at only the anterior teeth, but I would like to consider the whole arch into consideration, recreate a new occlusal scheme, increase the vertical dimension, and accordingly get the horizontal relationship also, and then uh, prepare the uh, patient for a new engram, and then give a full mouth rehabilitation. We have another problem where we cut encounter uh, is the uh, black triangle. So we have an interdisciplinary approach for this black triangle with the restorative procedures, periodontal, orthodontic. Uh, so I would like to ask uh, Jayashree ma'am and Ramya ma'am, how uh, can we uh, go uh, treat such cases? Yeah, I would like to say that you can uh, consider this uh, Tarnos recommendation. 
his classical article where he recommends that the distance between the crest of the alveolar bone and the contact point should, if it is less than five millimeters, if you do a, you know, in this kind of a situation for the maxillary central incisors, you can do a simple diastema mark closure with composite resin. If you, in, if you sort of improve the contact point, see that the distance between the contact point, a contact area and the crest of the alveolar bone is about five millimeters or lesser, then the uh, black triangle will automatically close. If it is more than that, then you have to think of uh, some other, uh, I mean, if, uh, you know, if the space is more, if the diastema is more like in the lower anteriors, you have to think of doing uh, some other procedure like uh, veneers. That is what will help to get the right uh, proximal profile of the tooth, emergent profile of the tooth, and it will also be able to close the diastema in that situation. Uh, uh, I agree with the Dr. Uh, Ramya. In the lower, uh, but however, in the lower, I would always think orthodontic treatment would give a better uh, a short term orthodontic treatment will definitely give a better option for closure of uh, the space. And then if the once you get the proper overjet and overbite in that case, and if you uh, still have some space, then we take a call whether it has to be a direct restoration or an indirect restoration, depending on the diastema that is there. But definitely a, a black triangle of this dimension, it's easier to close only in case of diastema, larger diastemas in the upper anteriors where the papilla would have really raised more epically. That's where the challenge will be, where you have to make a decision whether you have to increase the contact length and uh, which to a certain extent you can increase, but beyond that you might, it will look very unesthetic, the, the tooth will look longer. Uh, so at that time, I think we need uh, to take um, assistance from the periodontist to see how much they can bring it down. So if you're giving uh, indirect restoration, in cases like this, it's always good to place the temporary restoration uh, for a longer period of time to see how much of uh, your periodontal tissue will creep into that interproximal region and to close the diastema, uh, to close the black triangle, and only then go for um, permanent uh, cementation of your veneers or uh, but in some cases where you have already placed the veneers and after a, after a couple of years, if there is a a uh, black triangle. If it is a veneer, you can still do some kind of a composite restoration from the palatal aspect and cover the diastema, but uh, not to a great extent. But if it's a crown, then it's difficult for us to manage uh, with the restorative means. You have to look into periodontal, uh, some kind of periodontal uh, uh, therapy there. Uh, yeah, as Jeshri Ma'am said, ma in the I would like to address Nimpia, ma'am. What can be the periodontal approach for such cases, ma'am? See, uh, if, uh, if the black triangles are because of the periodontal disease, then only it can be treated periodontally. Because we have to see, after if we, if we think like this case, this is not periodontally involved. So, uh, as I said, in health, periodontal tissues, the gingiva tissues always follow the bone. If the bone is at that level, gingiva will be over that. If it's... Uh, disease and we see uh, after that if it's disease and we always say that uh, the gingiva and the bone move in two different directions at that point of time we will have to see that uh, whether this is only soft tissue loss or it is uh, hard tissue loss also if it's hard tissue loss also we can go for augmentation and then uh, the uh, creation of new this black this papilla and that is called uh, pap uh, papilla uh, formation. And in those cases, we can use connective tissue grafts and all that. But these black triangles, because of periodontal disease, can be treated periodontally also. If there is that discrepancy of the contact point and the alveolar bone, then it cannot be treated. And the predictability of treating uh, black triangles with the connective tissue grafts or, or papilla augmentation is not very good. Because uh, these are very small areas, the blood supply in the connective tissue is very minimal and it's very difficult to support the soft tissues over there. So it's only in the cases where there is periodontal disease and black triangles have been caused by periodontal disease can there be papal augmentation. In those cases, we can do for papal augmentation. Thank you, ma'am. So, so for, just one thing I want to add. For postgraduates, kindly remember a few things. One is the rule of five, but Dr. Ramya has said that mm -hmm. from the 
interposterous uh, osseous crest to the to, to your contact point mm -hmm. distance should be 5 mm every increase in 1 mm distance there will be 50 50% uh, loss chance of you know, not filling that not filling the uh, uh, the gingival embrasure so kindly ensure it that that when you plan it it should be 5 mm interposterous distance that, that distance from the contact point and the supracostal level has to be 5 mm not more than that otherwise chances are like are decreasing every increasing 1 mm 50% chance are decreasing. Secondly, the, again, the 3 mm also between the two teeth, what Dr. Uh, Jashri has said, she would prefer to go for an uh, orthodontic moment. From the interproximal distance between two teeth has to be 3 mm for proper maintenance of the papilla. So 3 mm distance, interproximal distance between the two teeth and 5 mm distance from the crest to the contact point. That should be remembered if you plan it. Because again, I'm talking, saying prevention is better than the cure. If you plan initially these aspirations, keep the contact like this, things can be minimized to some extent. Because otherwise, it's a very difficult procedure, but Dr. Nibia will say, if you go for uh, grafting, other things, they are very difficult things. You can prevent these things by taking this, this thing in mind. Next, uh, we come to the pontic design. I would like, like to ask, there are various types of pontic design as we cross the literature theoretically. But I would like to ask Padnaban sir, which is the best suited for the periodontal tissue and among these, which is the uh, best uh, pontic design, sir? Preferable one, sir? Uh, uh, not, not, not the periodontium, you're talking about the uh, subpontic area. Okay, the rest of the area, rest of the area. For the posteriors, the uh, ideal will be the ovid pontic which is uh, self-cleansing and aesthetically acceptable also. Those sanitary pontics are uh, the most, most ideal when it comes to cleansing. Normally, in clinical practice, we don't come across such a large space for you to create a good sanitary pontic because the gap should be almost about 3 millimeters of the soft tissue to the intact surface of the pontic, which we normally is not seen uh, clinically. And if you're going to create, what will happen is the connector design will be jeopardized or it's going to be compromised. It may result in a fracture of the connector area. So sanitary pontic is indicated only in cases where there is going to be a huge resorption. We can think of that, but we don't come across that kind of cases very often. <clears throat> and with regards to the uh, anterior pontics, most often we think in terms of modified ridge lab because it gives you a very good aesthetics and it also gives a very good emergence profile and you will be able to manipulate engineer the soft tissues to get a good uh, you know like uh, uh, emergence profile to achieve a better aesthetic especially with modern ceramics you will be able to create good aesthetics so modified ridge lab for the anteriors and ovate for the posterior and in select cases, we can think in terms of a sanitary pointing when there is going to be a huge restoration. For pre-polar areas, you can think in terms of a skin pointing where there's going to be a very minimal contact and huge uh, self cleansing area because most of the uh, cases, uh, you come across pontic inflammation when you remove the bridge. So if there is going to be a minimal amount of contact, this is going to be an ideal situation for all the anterior premolar and the maxilla, I mean uh, posteriors, I have suggested all the three things that should be. Thank you, sir. So when you talk about the indirect restoration, the first thing comes home to my mind is the placement of the uh, margins. So uh, Jeshri, ma'am, I would like to ask you, uh, the placement of the rest, uh, margins in such uh, restorations. As we already uh, discussed, I would always like to keep it suprajigival as much as possible. But however, since this is anterior, uh, it depends on what is what is the reason for you to give a, a restoration in a case like this where the tooth uh, substrate color is good except in the incisal edge, the gingival area, the color is good. And if you're not going to jump any colors, that is you want to maintain the existing uh, shade of the tooth, I think uh, uh, equigingival or supragingival is a good uh, uh, margin to place. And here, of course, uh, we uh, the tissue is very, very sore. 
very uh, inflamed. I would think you should give a temporary restoration here and make sure that the margins of the temporaries are very smooth, very good, so that the tissue adapts well to the temporaries. And you see a nice firm tooth where when you remove the temporaries, it should not bleed and it should not interfere in your uh, bonding procedure. So maintaining very good tissue, very healthy tissue before you prepare the tooth and also while you bond is very, very important. Uh, Nabhan, sir, would you I would like to ask you that uh, can, uh, in the lower picture, lower uh, image, the can, uh, we can see the can, uh, canine, that crown is over contoured, sir. Correct. Would you like? 100% over contouring is a double no. It is okay, it is absolutely okay to have a flat crown, that is uh, uh, less bulge and under contour thing is okay because there is going to be good stimulation of the periodontal uh, tissues and the pre-gingival margin will be at health. But if you're going to have an over contour, and as uh, Madam uh, Nifius Madam uh, has uh, mentioned sometime back in the beginning of this discussion, the rule is uh, there is a numerical value. Five, uh, 0 0.5 millimeters beyond the C junction is going to be very, very deleterious to the uh, tissues because you will never be able to have a good uh, 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 plot control of this particular area. So. Uh, uh, anything which is over contoured beyond 0 0.5 millimeters at the CG junction is going to be deleterious to the to 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 to, to the free gingival margin as well as the periodontium. Do you agree, madam? Yeah, of course. Uh, this is uh, this creates under uh, uh, this uh, this creates an area which is which is very conducive to the plaque accumulation, and this is undercuts, and it will be within a few uh, weeks only there will be uh, inflammation and bone loss. Cases. It's better to go for under contouring rather than over contouring. Right. Correct. So this is again a case where there is a joint crown. So I would like to ask whether such crowns are recommended or not. And what about the interproximal health, sir? Can you change the slide, please? All right, lovely. So uh, uh, the as far as possible, it is always preferable to go in for individual. <laughs> Absolutely individual crowns. You think in terms of joint crowns only when you're going to plan a cantilever or you want an additional support, additional support. Or if you feel that the particular adjacent tooth, uh, one of the two teeth uh, which is involved has got a very, very short clinical crown, you need a reciprocal retention. You will think in terms of uh, uh, using a jointed crowns like this. But in this particular situation where there are two nice good teeth which have been root treated pretty well and then uh, the idea will be to go in for two individual crowns with a good contact point or contact area and a good embrasure both occlusal as well as uh, gingival will certainly enhance aesthetics and also gingival health i would always prefer to go in for individual crowns for two reasons one is as you said rightly, the interproximal uh, cleansing is going to be very, very difficult, number one. Number two is the periodontal play of these two teeth are different. So whenever you talk, you bite, there is going to be a little amount of tooth movement. When it is going to have, when, when you're going to have two different periodontal play of two different teeth, and if this is going to be adjacent, the stronger teeth will become much, much more weaker than, than what we normally think. You know, like the weaker tooth will become stronger, it doesn't happen at all. So not what, hap what happens normally is the mobility will only increase to a larger extent. So in my opinion, individual crowns are more, most ideal for two reasons, for cleansing and because also that they have two different differential uh, periodontal place. Uh, ma'am, what about the interproximal tissue predictability in such cases? Ma'am, you have I'm not sure about uh, the interproximal region, I think I agree with Dr. Padmanabhan that uh, crowns, when you have tooth, it has to be given independent crowns. And uh, the tissue there, since we don't have any bone in that region, uh, I think the tissue will hold good. Uh, I think Dr. Nymphia will be able to yeah, say... I, the will, I want to add one thing. Over here, see the x-ray is in a region where the arch is trying to uh, uh, go in a different direction. So these x-ray may not have been 
may not give us the clear picture. If you see the clinical picture, there will be some bone over there. So what okay. we need to do is that we need to think about the contact point and the bone over there. If you take a uh, X-ray in a different direction, I am definite that there will be bone because I can see from the clinical picture that this is not that the two roots are very closely placed. There is a separation and there will be bone. So here, as Dr. Padmanabhan said, we give two clinical crowns, give the contact point at least five millimeter away from the uh, alveolar crest. Thank you, ma'am. So. Uh, Class two restorations, we've already discussed uh, in the subgingival restoration, whether we should go for a deep marginal elevation or surgical crown lengthening. Uh, I think Ramya ma'am or Sanjay Tiwari yes, sir would like to emphasize on this something, a few lines. All, this has already been discussed. Yes, sir. Uh, we can go for deep marginal elevation when there is a good isolation is there. Otherwise, when there is encroachment of the, of the dentary tissue and the, and the, and the Biological bit, we have to go for surgical ground lengthening. That has to be that has to be seen. And again, I am saying you please remember to respect the periodontium. If you respect the periodontium, the any tooth which can be restored, uh, where the good healthy periodontium can be restored, that can that only that tooth can can, can survive. Otherwise, it will keep on giving you problem. So yeah. I, I just I, and I Ramu, yeah, I totally agree with this decision uh, tree that has been made. The interproximal approach is deep marginal elevation, especially when you have not encroached upon the junctional epithelium or the uh, connective tissue attachment. If that is not the case, deep margin elevation works well. But when that happens and this has become a periodontal defect and a problem, then you have to think of surgical crown lengthening. So with this, I would like to thank all the panelists uh, for their valuable time. And I would like to conclude that challenge still remains how best to attain such treatment uh, outcomes in our everyday clinical scenario. So the debate still go, goes on, but we have to maintain the periodontal health. W whatever restorative procedures we are doing or prosthodontic procedures we are doing, that the interrelationship of the uh, rest, uh, restorative and periodontal interrelation has to be maintained. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists and I would like to thank uh, Dr. Mohan, who has given this opportunity, and Chandrasekhar sir, who has given this opportunity for the uh, discussion, and they have given us a platform for a, pa a very good uh, platform for a panel discussion. And uh, uh, last, I uh, know the least, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Laura for her constant support during making of this presentation and during the uh, all these uh, days. So she has been a constant help for me. Thank you. Dr. My work is still not Thank over you. yet. Yeah. I have some very uh, important four questions which I have listed out. I know. This one. Sorry, I'm sorry. I forgot about the viewers' question. Please go on, Laura. <laughs> so a uh, lot of people have asked me uh, whether hyaluronidase injections or gingival fillers are they good enough treatment protocol for black triangle closure? Yeah, there are those Botox injections have been uh, tried in some cases and they have given good uh, results because many uh, patients don't want to go for the surgical therapy and uh, Botox in injections are there, they are like uh, they uh, will augment the connective tissue and uh, they have been used in those cases. But again, the important thing is that you have to maintain the periodontal uh, health. If, even if they anything that has to be successful, they, it has to be augmented with the periodontal health. Botox injections um, have been used and they have been hyaluronic injections have been used and uh, they have been successful in many cases. But again, uh, the, the, it depends upon what type of uh, why the black triangle has uh, actually is there. Is it because of uh, the periodontal problem or because of uh, the restorative that the teeth position is not uh, correct or there is some tooth material? Um, another question, Sir Padman Abhin, sir, uh, if, uh, if you're still with us, uh, one question is, what is the best clinical method of assessing the margins of the crown? First and foremost is, uh, before cementation, we have to assess it in the model. So you must make sure the technician has uh, made the dies, and then you have to first check whether the crown or a fixed partial denture is fitting fine in the model. So unless it is going to fit fine in the model, it is not going to fit fine in the oral cavity also. If you feel that there is going to be a marginal discrepancy, how will you find out in the model? So you normally take, uh, 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 um, you know, like the, the clutch pencils you normally use, 
a 0 0.5 millimeter uh, lead pencils. It comes in different colors. You make a red color, just mark the margins and see whether there is any discrepancy in a normal naked eye. If that is going to be ascertained with the naked eye, if there's going to be a margin opening, ideal will be to ask the technician to repeat it even before you try it in the oral cavity. The second is try fit the crown. When you try fit the crown, you make sure that it is fully seated. Normally, if it is not seated, you will still have a margin opening. Make sure there is no proximal uh, interferences when you seat. After you totally seat the uh, crown, uh, you can even use uh, pressure indicating paste and then make sure that uh, it uh, totally seats in. When you seat in, the first thing that you would like to see is visually examine whether there are any openings. If there are not openings, now you can go in for uh, a radiograph. A radiograph will give you a very clear picture of proximal openings, not the buccal and the lingual openings. Buccal and the lingual openings can very well be clinically be seen. The third is after you ascertain that there is not much, you can always use a probe and then uh, 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 run your probe along. If there is going to be a margin opening, the crown will pop out. Or alternatively, you can also use floss. If there is going to be a, a, a tearing of the floss, that obviously means that there is going to be a margin opening. In this situation, how will you assess whether it is acceptable or not acceptable? It is a clinical acumen which is going to ascertain. If you are going to insert the probe and there is going to be resistance for the probe, I think it is good enough. Clinically, we will be able to do only this much. We will not be able to see whether it is 25 microns or 30 microns. You can only use a probe if the probe is not going to go in between the tooth and the crown. That obviously means that it is a reasonably well done crown. You can polish, smoothen all the uh, margins and then you can go ahead with the cementation. So clinically, you will be able to assess it with these three types and then we can cement it as the normal protocol. Thank you. I'll just have two more questions uh, with me. Uh, what is the importance of occlusal embrasure? Why is it, I mean, it's not discussed, but uh, uh, Mahalakshmi ma'am has asked, ki, uh, why is, uh, what is the importance of occlusal embrasures in uh, restorations? All embrasures are spillways. Basically, they allow the food to go smoothly over the tooth and it doesn't allow any food impaction to happen. That is the primary reason why you need to give all, you need to maintain all the embrasures, whether it is occlusal, gingival, buccal or lingual, all embrasures have to be maintained because they are spillways for the food to go smoothly over the tooth without it impinging on any particular region. And lastly, if uh, depending on contact and contour, is there any choice of restorative material uh, which we can select? If we have to establish ideal contact and contour uh, in a given situation, which direct material or which indirect restorative material will be best be able to replicate? I don't think uh, there is any one material that would be able to get the right contact and contour. You have to see on a case by case basis, one uh, clinical case basis, you have to decide which would be the right material. If it is a narrow contact, direct materials would be would work well. Like amalgam will work well or uh, direct composite will work well. Slightly broader contact also direct composite will work well. If it is a broad contact, then you have to think of indirect options, either composite or ceramic inlays or onlays, whichever would be the case. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone. If I may uh, add on to this. If I may yes, add on to this. The yes, sir, please. Undergo a constant abrasion. There is yes. loss of tooth material or the restorative material at the contact. So if you are able to get a material which has got the same abrasive resistance like that of the uh, tooth, it will be very, very ideal. We don't have any such materials. That is the reason why I normally, I said, I prefer a noble a lot because the, uh, uh, the creep and flow of the noble a lot will compensate for the discrepancies and then the contact will be built much better. That's the reason why I always go for metal. So if I may add one thing, proximal wear and tear is not so much as occlusal wear and tear. Very true. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. But the proximal wear is the cause for your uh, you know, food stagnation or, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 that's the reason why from the contact point it goes to a contact area. That is because of the abrasion. So when, when there is going to be abrasion, the contact area increases. So nowadays, the composites are pretty good. Their uh, wear rates are comparable I, I to... I agree. I agree. I agree. Absolutely, I agree. It is my, pre pre my preference. You know, like, you, you can always differ uh, 
uh, depending upon the case situation. I prefer gold and uh, I, I, I'm very happy with that. Simple. Yeshri would like to add something about this? Yes, I, I always go, uh, I'm more of an aesthetic uh, uh, person. So I would, uh, I would any, <laughs> any of the, uh, I, I'm, I'm a, I like to do lithium disilicate most of the times because I can be as conservative as possible with that. And the composites are my choice of material for uh, any kind of contact building. Direct with analysis. such a diverse panelist, uh, it, the discussion can go on and on. I uh, thank each panelist who took part in this panel discussion, expect, especially uh, Dr. Jigyasa for excellently moderating the session. Uh, just to make the viewers aware that uh, we are having next week a panel discussion on unveiling the myth of cleaning and shaping and it will be moderated by Dr. Paramita Majumdar and we have Dr. Vivek Hegre, Dr. Vasudev Balal, Dr. Venkatesh Babu, Dr. Narsimhan Bharadwaj and Dr. Gyan Lulaka. If I'm getting his pronunciation wrong, sorry, excuse me. So we'll be waiting next week with you again with the huge extravaganza of the panel discussion. Thanks to all the panelists. And uh, thanks to Dr. B. Mohan, our president, sir, our past president, uh, president Dr. Girish Parmar, for uh, being part of uh, this program. Thank, thank you so you. much, Dr. Thank Mohan. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, Dr. Dr. Mohan, and thank you, Dr. Mohan and uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, for giving us this opportunity. We thoroughly enjoyed this session today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaste thank you. and uh, good night to good night. each one of you. Uh, and uh, we look forward uh, to further associated uh, associate with you for fu uh, future discussions. Thank you so much. Yeah, Jigyasa, ma'am. We forgot the participants. They have been sitting for two and a half hours. We should thank them also. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> of course, of course. Thank you, thank you so thank much. You. Thank you so thank much. You so much. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Really enjoyed.